couple of hours. How did you get a magic letter about it? Gonna be more days at least to get that, surely. Time means nothing here. By the time another three days passes to get the mithril there, they'll be dead. That we delay costs us unthinkable wealth. So as the king chooses wealth over his own family, it makes this guy doubt himself and uh, doesn't really seem like our king, does it? That's why he turns up to Deezer. Slow to learn, are you? Easy, lads. I mean, I don't understand how they think they're gonna stop him, but also they don't want to fight in the first place. Turn around. I luck. Aren't I really intimidating? I'm showing my leg with an axe. They're literally going to fight just the two of them against all the dwarves. But luckily, the other guy's like, no, no, it's not our king. It's not our king. We're with you. We stand with you. Down your axes. If you were going to surrender, I don't know why you raised your hammer at him, intimidating him for. Coincidentally, though, there's another elf outside that wants to speak to him. Except this elf has been banned from all dwarven lands. He was going to go to fight, but he's come back so that Jorin can have him one last time. Oh. So romantic. Elrond. My heart sings to see you, old friend. I bet it does. You tidal hair, flowery tongue, flagpole. No wonder you bought up his flagpole. I mean, he's basically gripping it right there. Yes. Elrond tells him, though, that Aregion is under assault and I can't really? defeat him with just my army. I need yours. If only High King Gilgadaddy Gil hadn't listened to a woman, he'd still have his army and could have gone down to save Aregion. Unfortunately, he decided to take military advice from his chef for absolutely no reason whatsoever. And she's basically lost the rings of power and destroyed a city. Well done, love. No wonder we only saw her in that scene. She's Hello, a complete idiot. I know I oh, asked too much of you, Dorin, but I need your axe, old friend. No, not that yes, one, Dorin. Ride you to victory. We can yes. do that later. I'll I mean your it. actual axe. Yes, also, he said the Hunter. thing. Uh, I need Hunter. it now. Ooh, I can't yes. wait. Been a long road to get here. Whoa. <laughs> it's hard. I'm hard to you. But then we flip over to the orcs that are just like playing musical instruments for no reason whatsoever. He's like a baby that's just found out it could smack its own face. We see the orc hordes that are just here for peace and to buy ice cream marching on a region. And they do actually have a decent amount of extras for this. As well as CGI people. Now you'll remember in the movies where the elven armies turned up. Immortals that had been trained in battle for centuries. An entirely different class of soldier compared to this mess where they just look like random soldiers who have no real idea what they're doing. And that guy has absolutely no screen presence whatsoever as a leader. Yeah. That guy can't even be bothered to pick a target. Hello. Everything else was deliberate and fluid, and they're just like, uh. Yes, sir. Hunter. Uh. <laughs> The elves in Rings of Power are altogether very unimpressive Hunter. people. Well, you see all the arrows missing them, and you're like, eh, I don't, I don't really want them to miss, though. I want them to be peak superhuman beings, Orders. especially if they don't have that many arrows in their quiver, and no one seems to be Hunter. bringing them more. Now, yes. there are military leaders and soldiers Orders. on the Hunter. walls, all with their superpowered elf eyesight, but luckily, somebody else is there to save them from their own ineptitude. It's the baker, everybody! Look, I've got some donuts for you! And I've spotted a siege weapon. Now, come on, pretty yes. big. And I know she's used to seeing big things in her life, but everybody else should be able to see the massive siege weapon Hunter. slowly being dragged across the battlefield. I mean, look at it. Hello. They've put skulls on it because these are just nice people that want to live in peace with their families in their own homeland. The badges on our caps, yes. they've got skulls on them. Are we the baddies? But luckily, the baker is here to give some military Orders. advice to the soldiers. Captain, they have a ravager. Do you mean Sauron or has he just been ravaging you? Before <laughs> Sauron ravaged her. <laughs> it's a good bloke. Yeah. yeah. It's hard to tell nowadays. So this guy walks around a pillar and he's like, we must take it down. I can't believe I never saw the siege weapon before. Back with Keller Brimble though, he's realized something's wrong. Wait, wait. Wait for what? I'm thinking. Yes. It's the rat doing yes, the same sir, thing it always has. And he realizes this is all looped. The same events keep happening all the time. It's like time is paused and there is more. Baron isn't a happy chappy. The embers. Celebrimbord, whatever. That one is a bit stupid. He's like, look, there's embers in my fire. It's like, yeah, there tends to be embers in fire. His better point is that this candle hasn't burnt down a single inch in hours. And Sauron comes clean. You sought peace, I gave it to you. I created this image around you, this world, so you could focus. You were thanking me for it earlier. Yes. Whatever this is, this is hardly a gift. 
You've never complained when I did it before in the bedroom, Calibrimbo. Or did you think you'd built a secret dungeon into your forge? And Sauron's kind of telling him the truth. You begged for my instruction. You needed this. Yes. You asked me for it. Listen to yourself. No, what have you done to me? No need to get emotional now, Grandma. But as he realizes, no emissary of the Velar would do this. Edward. He asks him who he is, and he gives the hot. I'm the one keeping the storm at bay. I'm the only thing protecting the city. But the fact that he's the one destroying the city. I just don't know why. I want the nine! No! <laughs> It was a pretty good throw for a granny, but unfortunately it breaks his windows and it allows him to hear the battle outside. Apparently, stained glass windows, Hello. incredibly soundproof. He can't make an umbrella that'll keep you dry, but his windows are top notch. With that, he goes out and sees the destruction he's caused. We see the, how he really looks and the absolute state that his forge is in. Funny thing is, though, he was playing about the fire earlier. It's exactly the same. <laughs> Turns out those embers were just real. Thing is, though, the rest of his forge is destroyed. There's like pillars yeah. collapsed and stuff, and you think, well, you must have realized that, right? Even if he created a mental image where those pillars were upright, there'd still be rubble on the floor, you'd be tripping over and visible objects and stuff. I don't even know why those pillars are collapsed, unless he's been getting hit with rocks and he didn't realize that either. <laughs> but as he witnesses the destruction that has been caused around him, <laughs> he finally realizes how Lord of the Rings fans feel. What have you done, Mr. Payne? Sauron, though, somehow looks more evil, despite the fact that he's demure in the front and dainty in the back. <laughs> and he finds out that his mithril jug was actually Advance. full of blood. What is this? You already know, mate, don't you, really? True creation requires sacrifice. Now, this was at least one explanation that I needed, because he never went to Khazad Dune twice. So after they refused him mithril, he's like, oh, I realize what I can do. Thing is, if you didn't need the mithril in the first place, I don't know why you didn't do this from the start. Yes. This is also obviously their explanation for the ring wraiths, because it was actually made from Sauron. And I don't necessarily have a problem I'll with explaining it. future things. The issue comes when you just break canon, create an entirely fabricated story, and then use your fabricated story to then explain things which yes. were canon later on. If you stick to the letter of canon the entire way through, at least your reasoning makes sense. But when you break it like this, and do things like make the rings out of order, just fabricate a load of stuff, then your reasons don't make sense because the thing that led up to it didn't make sense. You finally realizes though you are he are you not i have many names i don't know why you can't just go i am sauron Gerald, <laughs> Rimbo. so obviously calibre rule leaves his tower and the same thing happens every time he leaves It's literally immediate. He takes one step forward, boom. Hello. I definitely think Iluvatar's yes. got it out for him. It's like, piss off, you useless tar. Oh. To be honest, best thing that's happened to kill a Brimbo all series. With that, though, he goes on the walls to see the fighting. And obviously, Builder. he seeks the commander of his army so that he yes. can give them orders. Oh, just kidding. No, he's after his baker. Yeah. Medallia, I need my jewel. You know how to make horseshoes, don't you? You'll be great in a fight. It's like they watched Pirates of the Caribbean, but genuinely thought that blacksmiths just knew how to use a sword immediately. We have been deceived. All of us. He planned all of this. Oh, you don't know that. It would be a bit stupid of him to try and make rings in a city and then also have an army march from that same city that you can't control. That'd be really stupid. Why would you think he's that stupid? To force me to forge the rings. No one forced him to make the rings. In fact, at one point, Sauron said, we shouldn't make any more rings. And Calibrimbo wanted to. A prisoner of the mind, but I'm out. I'm out. I think you've been out for quite a while, Calibrimbo. Just, just say it. Despite all this, obviously, his main issue was is he talking to Medania. You have to believe me! At the same time, the siege weapon hits the wall, and they have to sort of hammer I'll these do, bolts yeah, into I'll the bricks, it. which then get pulled out of the wall by this machine. Yes. Pour some oil oh, over and set fire to it. It's made of wood, and it's by the wall. This is really easy. Orders? No one does that. Nor do they drop anything on them, fire anything Number at them. Jack. They just let this machine destroy the wall. They just need murder holes or something. They'll just lean over. It's stupid. This is the thinnest part of the wall. Why do you have a thinnest part of the... Why isn't the wall the same thickness the entire way around? And if you do have a thin part of the wall, get some barrels of oil to pour over the side for siege machines. We have to break the foundations! Or set fire to the wooden device. Get this archer next to you yes. to shoot at the siege machine. His problem is that Sauron has turned up. He tells everyone, seize him, seize him. He is Sauron. I mean, Remember, do it. Instead, everyone around him is absolutely thick as pig shit. But what did he expect when he went to her. I've been getting rogered by him for weeks. I know I really love getting on my back for evil, but you've got a dirty face. I can't trust you. Seize him! 
He has been lying to you all along. He has been protecting us. That's right, Sauron. Always uses protection. You know, wouldn't want any accidents stopping me go yes. out and party in another weekend. I've been in your tower giving orders that might have been the end of us all. Yeah. They've been listening to orders that came from Sauron and for some reason don't think they're Saurons. No, they're definitely Calabrimbors, despite Can't the fact they've never seen Calabrimbor. So the first time they see their commander, they're like, oh, but he's been telling us what you've been saying, despite the fact that you've said he's got you locked up in a tower and we haven't seen you because you've been in your Always. tower. Everybody here is an idiot. No, that was him. He is Sauron! If you do not believe me, and they're about to get worse. Now, firstly, we should be to get a knife and hit that guy in the jugular because he shouldn't be commanding any army. He's too thick. But so is Celebrimbor's proof. He says, if you don't believe me, you can cut him. Cut him open and you'll yes. see that he has black blood. Black as bitch. The issue is Sauron just shows them his hand and it's red, which Celebrimbor should have expected because he knows he can make people see things because he's been making him see things for weeks. So obviously, oh, has got red blood? Oh, you must be wrong because you're an idiot and we're idiots. There is a better thing, though. The best thing. The funniest thing. The best moment of the entire series. Come, my lord. Ooh. I don't think you've got the equipment, love. Get your hands off me! <laughs> no! Never gets old. I need to see that again. Get your hands off me! <laughs> no! At least Modania gets what she deserves, eh? Sauron did promise her. Yeah. Come, my lord. Now we can have Alrond, Arandur, and Sauron. All as actually good characters that will give people what they deserve. So she dies, and um, yes, good. This, for some reason, this turns the guard against him, despite the fact that they're literally following Sauron. Finish the line, and I will spare you. He has no reason to believe this is true, and also, it's Sauron. The answer is no, no, I'm not going to do that. You're Satan. I'm not going to do anything you want. He goes along with it, though, because he's an idiot. At that moment, though, they hear a horn. For some reason, Alrond has decided to just announce his presence on the battlefield. What an idiot. Because he's got his cavalry coming and the gun to do a cavalry charge. These work best on disorderly enemies that don't Orders. know you're there. Or, of course, you could just announce that you're arriving, in which case everybody can form up in ranks. It looks like a particularly impressive amount of horsemen. There are a lot of orcs, though. Now, you can tell that these are all just loving fathers that want Carpenter. peace and have no intention of attacking anybody who isn't innocent. When they scream like that at the camera, they're definitely the good guys. There's a broad range of nondescript people. So I wonder who's going to be focused on. Well, there's a diverse array of horses. Oh, and, and people too. Yeah, yeah, there we go. We don't look at anybody else in this elven army. It's just, yep, the woman and um, the guy that was born before the sun who seemed to know it was coming. Now with this army, you also have High King. Oh. Daddy. It's a shame he didn't bring all his armies really because then they might have actually won. I can't beat Adar can't and Sauron in more. It turns out you can't even beat one of the armies, mate. You're a bit crap, really. The elves charge though in a triangular formation. Obviously, Minor. if you armor a horse, the one area you don't want any protection is the bit which is going to take the spear. No, where you really want to arm it is along the horse's back to protect the horse from the soldier's arse. That's the most dangerous bit of a war horse. Yes. The issue is the orcs bring Galadriel's cage there. Minor. Reveal that Galadriel's there with a knife at her throat. Oh, not Galadriel! Orders. Personally, I would have just add this as an added bonus. You can stab her through the cage on the way past. I mean, you can obviously stop a horse to perfect line like that. <laughs> Definitely not going to have people crashing into you at cavalry speed. No, no. Instead, he needs, I'm going to have a little talk with the evil. So they meet inside the orc camp with no weapons, just assuming that Adar is going to respect a truce, an orc. Innately evil since birth. Well, I suppose he was an elf. But he's still an orc now, an evil orc. The ring. You carry. Show it to me. Foolish act that I had brought it here. True. He did bring it here, though. He, he he actually did. He's basically just calling himself an idiot. This is bad writing, but we know it is. You are a courtier, more suited to wielding a scroll than a sword. How do you know? How does an orc know about the personal life and career path of Alrond? You've never seen me wield either. You should have just kept charging Alrond. I agree with both of them. Alrond's based and Galadriel should have died. This is the story we need. If she speaks again, cut out her tongue. Okay, every man in this scene keeps winning. Can we do it anyway? That's what I want to know. I don't want to correct your anatomy lessons too much, but that's not her tongue, just so we're all aware. So they have a back and forth. How may defeat Sauron? But you're just following Sauron's plan by laying siege to a region. And yes, the problem is the same as last week. Adar knows he's following Sauron's plan. He says that Agregion has fallen under the shadow along with every elf in it. Not Calabrimbor! It was Calabrimbor himself who welcomed Sauron in. 
How do you know? The orcs were nowhere near a Regeon at the time, even if they had spies, which they don't, because elves would know what an orc looked like. Orcs don't have elven spies. And yet somehow they have a knowledge of history, presumably because they've read the script, or just because they can't abstract, so every single character in the show has the same information. Adar says, though, that you can't save a Regeon, but you can save Galadriel. You have the beauty of your foremother, Melian of the Valar. How do you know? Now he knows his history and heritage. And he's like, well, if you have even an ounce of her wisdom, you should know I'm correct. You cannot defeat me in battle. I will outmaneuver you. My forces outfight yours. I've got a bigger dick. My children have endured cruelties. Your couldn't bear to hear spoken aloud. Yeah, and they did them to each other. Why is the evil guy who's leading evil people going, I can't believe they've done some horrific things? Is they're just as likely to eat each other as anybody else, dude? How was that baby conceived? How was that baby conceived? <laughs> Are you prepared to spend their lives so freely? Alron, though, somehow knows all about Adar. I don't know how. Never met him before. Are you willing to spare their, send those lives so freely? It's like, yeah, they're orcs, dude. What do orcs do? Are they? And the father's like, oh, but I don't want to die because I've got a little baby. And yes, everybody around me might be evil and just desperate for war, but I'm not, I'm not. If he turns out to be Caliborn, a tie, I'm going to wet myself laughing. As he says, though, the ring for Galadriel's life, Alrond. Alwan rocks around him and takes a pin off his shoulder. I will see you on the field. But first, can I talk to Galadriel? And so he goes over to pass her the pin. And rather than just hugging her or grabbing her hand instead, Alrond really has to get something off his chest. Chest. Forgive me. I need to fondle your face like he's blind and trying to work out what she looks like. I ship him. I don't know why we needed the heroic music. I've got to. Be... <laughs> Finally, Aaron did something worthy of the heroic music. And as he backs off, he says, I'm gonna shag your daughter later. You think those orcs have been through some unspeakable things? You should see what I'm gonna do to her. <laughs> your daughter doesn't need to learn how to walk. I'm gonna make sure her life is spent horizontal. She's gonna be bed bound, but not because she's sick, because I am. <laughs> So he uses that to pass the pin. He doesn't even do it discreetly. Look, here it is. There's literally an orc staring at them as they're about to pass it. Look at that! This guy! This guy's just staring at it! Hello. Yes. They'll never realize, Galadriel. Ah, Galadriel, you taste exactly how I thought you would. Bitter. Don't buy your daughter any shoes, love. She's going to spend her time on her knees. They say, though, that we can't beat the orcs. Oh, we can, because I know something they don't. Jorin will appear at the first sunlight from the north. Right to the now. That is the problem with his plan. Jorin's three days away and then three days back. So he's supposed to do a six days journey in yes. about 12 hours at maximum. Builder. Luckily, he is the spitting image of Sauron in his original form. So maybe he's got superpowers. Meantime, I will ensure that Aragion's walls hold for one more night. Or six, if you actually want to stick to the size of the map. <laughs> No, I'm sure dwarves are just really fast running across the ground with their little legs. During all of this, Jorin's trying to raise an army with his inspirational speech. We see Galadriel pick her locks. The weird thing is, he starts with this. Warriors of Khazad do! And then within about 30 seconds, you see these people. Hello. Ah, yes. The mighty warriors of Khazad Doom. <laughs> You go and fight them, love. I'll just throw cakes at them. They'll be so busy eating, they won't be able to fight, and you can run them through. I'm used to being run through. The orcs won't be, though. Sauron the Stoneheart. Get yeah, image of Calibrimbor continuing his rings, but this time he's locked up. And for some reason, doesn't take that as the hint that I probably shouldn't be making these. Now, I would ask why Calibrimbor has big, thick shackles just around his forge. But then again, secrets from our forebears. And all. You know why. I yes. got these from our dungeon, Calibrimbo. Sauron the Stoneheart, who stole the seven smithing secrets. I also like that Jorin says he stole the seven smithing secrets from us, one of which I'm assuming was alloys. What if we mix things, though? And we see the king head out of his throne room with an axe. There hopes a storm to fish in between us with our greed. Look at this entire front line. The entire front line. F, F, F. F. I'm pretty sure there's an F behind his hair. F. Order. F here just off the screen. Another F. F. That entire front line of people are all the women of Khazad Doom, which literally came under Warriors of Khazad Doom. 
Oh, it's a mighty kingdom. No wonder it got defeated by a Balrog. So all the world can oh, see that dwarven so loyalty. I don't really know why the dwarves have loyalty to the elves, but here we are. It's like, yeah, loyalty is stronger and deeper and mightier than any armies. Will you fight with our friends? I just want him to go, nah. Just because he's been bending yes. you over a stepladder doesn't mean that I'm going to go and die for some city in a far off land I've never Orders. been to and don't care about. The yes. answer's no, Jirin. All right. Will you fight for Kazad Doom? They're not threatening Kazad Doom, you silly twat. <laughs> This is a Region. You've got your geography mixed up. And there's a mighty army outside that have listened to him as well. Because he's got a massive gob. But a Region! Where's the Region? I've only ever been down here. In general, never march an army to a place that you can't point to on a map. I think that's, that's got to be the a minimum requirement, surely. So we see the elves fight and Alron's horse doing work. <laughs> I mean, I don't think it needed to be that flamboyant, but here we are. Now, the elves are a bit stupid and decide to charge the cavalry into a forest like idiots. Cavalry is for the open fields like you had before. You know, where you stop charging them. Now, over time, Alron kills a lot of people, but then eventually... Well, he just gets knocked off by a single orc with a hammer. Other horsemen get bogged down in the riverbed. I don't know why they were riding across a riverbed. And Elrod sees, oh no, please don't. I can't believe you killed my horse. I actually don't know why he killed his horse. Oh, sorry. Yeah, it's because they're evil and not because they just want peace and loving families with everybody. Now, Elrod gets really bothered by this and I don't really know why. He only rode a horse in episode one for a bit at the start away from Galadriel. Is that, I love that horse. It meant I didn't have to talk to Galadriel for weeks. Ron has a lot of trouble defeating this orc. Which is weird considering he's just a basic orc who can even steal his helmet. Although he eventually beats him. Fires him a Region. I mean, on the one hand, kind of based. On the other, you are launching rocks at your own city. The odds of that killing your own people is relatively high. <laughs> kind of funny though, gotta admit. The issue there is we've got to have this scene with him and his horse. I really loved your horse that has never been in the pissing series. I think they're really going for a Witcher moment. The issue is it wasn't earned at all. We're just supposed to care about it randomly. They probably watched the Witcher and were like, oh, look, when horses die, the audience gets involved. It's like, no, it's because it was his horse which had joined him on all the journeys. Alrond ran across the country for most of the time. Whoa. You could have at least had him with a horse in those journeys and like showed him bonding with it. He's like, no, I forgot about you now. I, I mourned you for about as long as I rode you. Oh. Is actually how most marriages work. That's why the most anyone's going to care about Galadriel's death is roughly 16 seconds. We have more fights on the wall and they actually start using ladders rather than trying to rip the stones out one by one. I really wish we'd seen more of this kind of stuff in the episode rather than Keller Brimble crying. And actually seen it evolve over time rather than cutting to it and being like, wait, how on earth did he get on the walls? They needed to get rid of this. This should have just had oil put on it and it die. I'm fed up with seeing this rip out stones. It's so pathetic. The fact that that hasn't been destroyed by people on the walls as last. You would have been better with traditional just ladders or those towers that the Romans had. The wall is stronger than we thought. Stronger than you thought? It required elves to be idiots for you to get as far as you did. But he says the elves have been faring better than you expected. They destroyed five trebuchets. Should we retreat? No, don't retreat. Sauron must not escape. Bring down that wall at any cost. Even your life, Mr. Father, who just wants to grill human flesh. Now, obviously, they're setting this guy up to eventually betray Adar, I think. Why they're like, oh, I'm putting out to have a little baby because he's evil. So they say, but it's, oh, I thought you loved us as so as his children. I love you too much to let you become Sauron's slaves. I really don't like that they're trying to say that in the Lord of the Rings, they're only evil because Sauron enslaved them. They're innately evil. They were born evil. They'll always be evil. As a species, they are determined to be evil. It's in their DNA. They, as a people, create their culture, and their Lumberjack. culture is evil. They find, though, that Galadriel's escaped. Lumberjack. For some reason, she left a pin here, just so we know who did it. And she decides that she's going to walk around about half the size of all the other orcs, with her face showing. Uh, we could all see that's not an orc, right? You could at least put some, like, orc gore on your face or something. So she runs around with the ultimate disguise of looking at the floor, and let's be honest, covered from head to toe, eyes down. It's good to see Galadriel embracing civilized society. <laughs> this, though, though, as she keeps showing her face and torchlight to everybody. Yes. 
looking at the pyres of the burning corpses, and she probably thinks they're trying to, like, cremate them or something. Like, no, they're cocking them for food, you silly bind. They're not evil. They're just eating people. The issue is, as you can see, she hasn't even yes. hidden her hair under her cloak. Even as a dar comes over to mourn the people that have died. Oh, I'm a little upset because I marched on a city I didn't need to march on and got my own people killed. And for some reason, I'm supposed to be mourning. Despite the fact that I didn't care enough to not do this. Oh, I'm so badly written. And Galadriel is, oh, I can see the humanity in him because I'm a woman that's just obsessed with my own feelings rather than looking at things objectively and thinking he's evil. Why am I feeling sorry for evil? Oh, that's right. I've just realized. Hello. Am I the problem? Of course, orcs have seen her hair. Follow her down a dark tunnel rather than telling all the other orcs about them, but because of absolutely no reason whatsoever. Look at that pretty hair. So bad yourself, Rob. <laughs> Aaron Deer is here to save her life. Look, for once in your life, stay off your back. Aaron Deer here is here to take on a dodge that really can't do that because then you'll die. He's taking everything else from me. Well, he doesn't have your nuts yet, but if you go in there, he'll definitely take them from you. <laughs> Seems to be her only thing. I'm just going to come on to him. There is a dearth of elven heroes this night. It would be a pity to lose another. Plus, I'll show you my hidden tattoo if you don't. Back in Khazad Doom, Durin is getting ready to march. Of course, there's always another problem, isn't there? Let's do this! The guy comes up, clearly injured, and he says the yes. king came down with his axe and just started hacking his way through us like a hot knife through butter. He's gonna dig, gonna loose that beast. How do you know there's a beast there? How do you know digging in that spot will free it? Oh, that's just the start of the problems. Disa, did you send me to find you? You have to recall the army. Yes, Disa's yes. here to cause more problems and get more people killed. She's already the reason yes. why these rings were created in the first place and every time she makes Carpenter. a decision it's Builder. wrong so you Carpenter. should definitely Builder. listen to her now Carpenter. just let a region burn because your father just appeared in a tunnel that he owns himself you take that army to a region now and Khazad Doom might not be here when you return nonsense Khazad Doom despite being three days away you can reach there in like six hours during the night time fight in the day come back in the evening what's gonna happen are you telling me that the king is going to mine make a hole to the Balrog the Balrog's gonna cat climb all the way up and wipe out the entire place in a day. There was an argument that could be made when you were like, well, we just want to compress all the time period so that all these people exist in the same time. But you can't have a Balrog destroying the entire thing in a day. Sauron, though, still whining. Oh, when people see what's going to happen in all the peace, Hello. they'll realize the suffering was worth it. It's like suffering wasn't required for any of this, though. I still don't know why the army is here. If the army wasn't here, Calabrimbor would have been fine. You wouldn't need to force him to make the rings. He says, though, I don't like to treat these people like this. Like you've treated all the others. Like Morgoth treated me. Oh no, you see, I'm a victim. I'm a victim, and so that justifies me doing it to other people. Because everything is equal, there are no heroes or villains. And so we drag down the heroism yes. and lift up the villains. Because it's not their fault, it's not their decision. Society made them do it, but they just had a rough childhood. That's why they turned into Satan. I hate the morality of this show. Do you know what it is to be tortured at the hands of a god? I know I don't care. I know that anything you did after that is still your responsibility, despite any meany things that might have happened to you. Somebody said 30 words at me. Morgoth called me fat. And the rest of the scene is just them trying to yes. pitch him as a victim, which is why he's got his crying face on. As if, oh no, I'm actually trying to do this because I'm the hero of the entire piece. I'm the hero of my own story. Oh, my it's like, no, it orders. isn't. He can see the yes. things which are happening. He knows it's not required. Yes. You're not intelligent enough or good at writing enough to justify this story and you haven't orders. justified it. For what he wished to destroy, I wished the perfect. Now, there would be an argument for this if he essentially wanted to make a perfect paradise, which would require no one to have free will. And so everyone basically turned into automatons. That would allow you to have Sauron as the evil villain, which is also fulfilling his objective to make paradise for everybody. It would just be from looking on the inside out. You're like, yeah, they're in paradise, but they can't make any decisions. They don't have any lives. They're just robots. That's hell, not paradise. Wheel of Time did this message, but we've seen the outcome of Sauron, and it's just fire and brimstone. There is no paradise at the end, so it doesn't make sense him believing it. So we described what Morgoth did to him, how he would look forward yes. to the pain, because it'd be like a test of wills to see who was mightier. Hella Brimbor says, but you still choose to inflict that pain on me? No, you were the one that caused that pain. All depends on the ring. And so, by standing in my way, you left me no choice. And since you forced me to, I meant you to bring it me. I am but a victim of your obstinance. I'm kind of surprised that Calibrimbor did just laugh in his face at this point. And you, the true author of your own told him, truly are the great deceiver. You can deceive even yourself. And they're basically just going for, oh, 
Oh, look, it's Hello. domestic violence. He's actually gaslighting that you're, no one will ever love you as much as me. Bang. That's all it is. And maybe this would have made a bit more way. sense if we'd seen Sauron rogering Celebrimbor senseless. Ah, <laughs> Celebrimbor, though, get, collects yes, all the rings and finishes them in the fire. He has absolutely no reason yes. to do this, by the way. <laughs> he could have destroyed them or not finished them, not made them, whatever. Now, we see the elven soldier's plan. They have, like, bags of fuel. They yeet them off into space and then fire a flaming arrow at it so that we rain a bit of fire down onto the soldiers. And I'm just thinking, why did you not do that on the siege weapon? The one single thing that is pulling the stones out of your wall. I didn't use one of the bags on that, eh? It's made of wood. We're really thick and stupid because we're immortal. And we spread out our IQ over our entire lifespan. We get like one every century. It was nice of that guy to stand in the right spot so he could get stabbed in the chest. But obviously, we've got Warrior Galadriel. I mean, sorry, sorry. Not Galadriel, is it? No. They all look the same to me. One nonsensical girl boss looks much like the rest. Celebrimbor, though, has finished the rings. Oh, they're not hot, though, even though they've just been in fire. It's just weird. Now, he collects them all in a bag because his plan isn't to give them to Sauron. And if you're not going to give them to Sauron, why have you made them in the first place? The only reason to make them was to give them to Sauron so he'd stop the sack of Eregion. So you're not even planning to do that. So just don't make them then. You idiot. He knows these are made with Sauron's blood. He knows they're evil rings. He's like, oh! gonna make him anyway. So he thinks that hammering one of his fun time manacles will work. It doesn't. And in the end realizes, I'm gonna have to cut off my thumb in order to get my hand out of this thing. Let's face it, it's not like you're gonna need it in the future anyway, is it? Sauron's not gonna let that thing near him anymore. Whose will is the mightier? Sauron. He just told you to make some evil rings that'll destroy the world and you were like, okay, I'll do it. Definitely Sauron's. Get what you deserve. I would have just done it on something that's further south myself. With that, though, he walks out of the tower again, and Aluvatar is still pit. I mean, look how far he gets. <laughs> Everything hits him immediately. Whee! Celebrimbor getting what he deserves. So the soldiers surround him and go, oh, he really has gone mad. We're going to have to keep you in the tower so you're not a danger to yourself. I'm like, hang on. He keeps saying he's being locked in the tower and now you're going to lock him in the tower. He's lost his thumb to escape the tower. And you're like, oh, it's a danger. Let's put him back in the place he cut his own thumb off. No place will be safer for you than surrounded by dangerous tools. Mind you, he is already surrounded by tools, isn't he, really? I mean, look at him. Waste of space. By order of Anatar. 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 Lord of Arabia. It's stupid to call him Lord of Eregion. I don't know why they flipped. They shouldn't have flipped. This is all really stupid. At that moment, though, Galadriel turns up. You shall release him! But the Lord of Eregion orders... This is the Lord of Eregion. And for some reason, the soldiers kind of resist this, which is weird, considering they're used to obeying women who are about four yes. foot nine. They've been doing it with Modania for weeks. I don't know why they have a problem with her. So he fills her in on what happens and says, I made nine rings. They're to, they're to enslave yes. men like he enslaved. And like, no, you did it all voluntarily. At one point, he even told you to stop making rings and you're like no i've got to continue this is all your fault voluntarily without interference he was just happened to be there now at no point does he tell her that these rings are evil they have an evil influence on people the dwarven rings are evil Hello. and these have sauron's blood in them so destroy them these things are never said i'm trying i'm blinding myself to what he was because i wanted what he offered so did i what did you want galadriel i wanted his dick i wanted him to treat me like one of those orc ladies the old dwarf but Gladwell tells him I came into a secret tunnel. We can get you out of here along with everyone else. We can go. He's like, no, I will delay, Sauron. You take the rings and as many people as you can out of that tunnel. What has happened? He will come for the rings. I will ensure it is some time. This doesn't make any sense. This is the guy that goes, I'll stand, delay him, and then just immediately dies and doesn't save him any time. Take the rings. Save anyone in the city you can. Never tells her the rings are evil with Sauron's blood in them. Seems like a piece of a major information, dude. I won't let you face him alone. I built this city on rock and roll. The soldiers, though, for some reason, have just entirely changed their minds because a little girl came up to them and gone, Ah, but Calabrimbo's in charge. That was enough to snap them out of Sauron's control for some reason. And so they go, no, he won't be alone. We will be with him. I'm sorry. I brought him here. I'm pregnant with his child. <laughs>
It is literally just a pity party between the two of them before Calibrimbor goes off to die for absolutely no reason. Everyone in this scene is an idiot. Everyone in this city is an idiot. So Calibrimbor suddenly turns philosopher. It's not strength that defeats darkness. The owls must all remember it is light. And as long as light is... Oh, God. It's like faux poetry. And I don't really care because he's evil. He's done evil. He's created evil. And why am I supposed to feel sorry for him? So Galadriel is carrying with her evil rings. And, and, and obviously, there's only one place she can really carry them. Just gonna stick him in my chest. Oh, they'll be nice and snug and safe in there, won't Hello. they? You know, evil, Lumber close death. to my heart, just where I want it. Now, Elrond has spotted the siege machine, and for some reason he doesn't go, Why has no one poured some fire on it? <coughs> Instead, Children. he realizes the truth. There's only one thing that can defeat that siege <laughs> weapon. A strong, powerful, independent, randomly foreign elf. <laughs> it's like, just one. Just one. <laughs> Genetics hold no sway over the elves. <laughs> Our enemy will not breach that wall. A single arrow from you may yet turn the tide. Only you can save us. We need your girl boss powers. <laughs> we are just mere men, but you have transcended the dangly bits. How many torch arrows do you have left? Enough to do my part. I think that means one. I like oh. the fact that she's got torch arrows. No one on the wall of them. No. None of them want to shoot it at the siege machine, which it. is directly next to them. Uh, they're like, no. Some random woman will appear from the other side. Hack her way through the army and she'll do it. I can't be bothered to lean. <laughs> Follow me! Oh, you know where you could have got a clean line of sight? On the wall where Galadriel was! So Elrond's going through hacking a path through the army for her. And she's following him, also doing kung Orders. fu fighting moves. Yes. Thinking as though, just as he gets line of sight on it. I don't heed! Take the Carpenter. shots, Galadriel! I mean, I'm sorry! You all look the same to me! <laughs> don't you think you overdid it a little bit? Look. The first one, okay, she got hit by a random arrow. My problem comes with everything else. Literally turns into a pin cushion within an instant from 360 degrees. How on earth do all these people have line of sight on her? How are these orc archers so good? At this point, I'm kind of thinking it must be elves, right? Must be elves on the wall shooting her. But no, look, look at me, Elrond. I've got one single arrow in my quiver. It's like face or terrible script writing. There's no need to give her one arrow when you've already shot yes. her through with like 10 different arrows Come killing on, her. She's gonna die anyway. She could have had spares. No, we must make it completely nonsensical. And so she uses her estrogen powers. <sighs> Don't worry, Elrond. <laughs> Luckily, I've got this fire. The perfect arms reach away from me just as I get shot with arrows and can't move. That was lucky. Now, I know Number the ten. music is like... Da, 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 really heroic, but in my mind, all I heard was... Everybody just stops it. fighting to watch the arrow fly through the sky. She got it in the... I don't know. I mean, it exploded, so you'd be like, fuel? It's a wooden machine. It doesn't need fuel. Why has it got explosives attached to it? Nobody knows. Don't ask questions. It'll be fine. And then when she's like, yeah, do my heroic moments just to take the piss yes. one more time. Honestly, I don't know why the wooden machine is exploding, but here we are. Charge! <laughs> Oh yeah, we've just got to shoot her in the face again. The car, I'm glad I got away from it. that. She's too strong and independent. Honestly, that arrow came from the wall. I can only assume that elves are shooting her. They're like, oh, piss off, we've had enough of you. We've seen your tart before. <laughs> you all look the same to me. Adar, though, is realizing that the tide is turning against him. So he's like, send him in. He will kill our own kind. I mean, that's what you've been doing. You literally marched on a city to die. I don't know why you're surprised that you're going to die. Does it matter if the elves kill you or someone from Breaking Bad? And so out comes the bald guy. Oh no! Am I supposed to fight that? Up in the tower, Sauron's going around looking for rings in random boxes before Calibrimbor re-arise for absolutely no reason whatsoever. You shall not find them here. What are you telling him? If you wanted to delay him the most, you'd be like, I've got secret stashes all over this room. There is no way you're going to find where I've hidden them. And you are going to bring them to me. That chance. And there's absolutely nothing you can stick in me that's going to change my mind. Your hand will never touch another ring. Now, for some reason, Calibrimbor thinks that a couple of soldiers can defeat Sauron. I don't know, maybe he watched the start of Series 2 or something and just got the wrong idea. Yeah. Because they circle him and he's just like, well, you know, haven't you realized by now, Calibrimbor, everybody's under my control. And so, as he turns his hands, the swords turn. 
I guess. Uh, this is pathetic. You were supposed to give people illusions that convinced them to do what you wanted, and now you're just brute force controlling them. If you could do that, why didn't you just get Calibrimbor to do it rather than convincing him all the time? And now you've given Sauron this power, you will cause trouble for yourself every time he doesn't use this. Anyone that trusts him, you just be like, oh, I'll just get him to you, you puppet him then. It'd be easy. There is no way you're going Whoa. to stick to this power. You've made him, and you made him way too powerful. Sorry, Jim. So Sauron easily wipes out everyone else. And you're like, well, why didn't he just do that before? Why, when Adar was crowning him, did he just not take direct control of him so he didn't die? Who knows? You will give me the nine inches. I demand it, Celebrimbor. Why do you think I put a bow in my hair? So dainty. Now the troll marches across and he's just like picking people up, throwing them through people, squashing over them. It is quite funny. Aaron Deer is firing his little toothpicks at him. Now, admittedly, Aaron Deer does at least look more professional with a bow than the other elves. But that's more because they should look more like Aaron Deer, not the other way around. They should put the same work in Aaron Deer did. It is funny when he has two people, sets them on fire, and then just shoots them into other people. Or when he's getting shot by all the arrows, and so he just grabs a couple of orcs. And all the elves just keep shooting the orcs anyway. That doesn't matter what we kill. Adar, absolutely no problem with his children dying. It's almost like you wrote a character Orders. into a corner and I have no idea how on earth you could make him logically follow on from that. So you just didn't bother. Meanwhile, they're like, oh, but the way. orc who just wants peace and her father is actually upset because people are dying. Definitely not going to betray Adar later, is he? <laughs> would have been funny if that was how Aaron Deer died. Got to admit. Except the troll notices Alrond. Alrond's sword is so crap, it can't actually cut through a rope. <laughs> this episode is very much like a carry-on film. I've got to be honest. There's bodies and people flying all over the place. Thing is, though, the rope snaps. Injures the troll in the stomach. This allows the one person who can save the day to ride in. And for some reason, he hasn't been doing anything for the rest of the episode. <laughs> He actually dies like Achilles with his tendons being snapped. Go back to your hill and be buried! It's Gilgit Daddy. He does slay in a certain way. He does. He does slay. <laughs> Arendir, though, dives on him. Do you remember this from the movies? <laughs> yeah, I don't know why. The weight of a single elf is enough to knock a troll on the floor. He's been putting on weight recently, eating a sealed earth. But now he's on the floor, it's easy for everybody. He pins down his arms and everyone rushes in and starts stabbing him with knives. In comes Gilgadaddy for the final blow, which is something that Gilgadaddy is especially proficient at. Should not be here! What do you mean? He's been here since the start of the battle. Before you charged, he was literally standing next to you. <laughs> king's place is wherever the need is great. Gilgadaddy. What about the king's army? Could you piss that off to Mordor? Because a woman told you to. They think it's all over, though. There's barely few elves left. Except there's loads of orcs. And the dog is doing his final push. So the rest of the orcs charge. All except the dad who just wants to grill human flesh on his own for his baby. The others, though, they're like, yeah, war! Let's go to war, yeah! Oh, look, I'm just seasoning these left thighs of an elf. Oh, no, war! Yeah, I can kill you here. Woo! We're not evil, though. But as the sun appears and Elrond is expecting a mighty army, nothing arrives. The dwarves! The dwarves are coming! They generally are. That's how they multiply, like rabbits. Except there's nothing in the north, except a single rider with arrows in him that tell them Durin turned his army around. It's a mistake. Durin will come. He's very proficient at yes. it at this point. And so, as an unbeatable army marches on them, rather than retreat into the fortress so they can use the walls as defenses, Gilgadaddy has an entirely different idea. Carolina! He trusts Alrond, who is convinced that Jorin definitely will finish. Jorin will come. He sure will, fella. I have faith you can do it for him. The two sides charge. Leaving Alrond in the muck, and you can see how few of them are left. Jorin will come. Jorin will come. He always has before. I see no reason he can't now. So we see High King Gilgadaddy go round and just spin slash everybody. Very flowery with his fighting. But Arandur only has one target, Adar. Now, for some reason, despite having dual daggers, he decides to drop them to pull out his bow. And just as he's about to shoot Adar in the face, an orc knocks him over and he misses. So he spin kicks him, doesn't get his daggers, and so he just literally gets stabbed with his own arrow that I'm assuming Adar caught, as I don't know how else it happened. He jabs him back with his own arrow, but if you had a sword, you could cut his head off or something. 
Adar's got a sword. Now Arandir feels how Jorin's gonna feel when Alron meets him again. And that seems to be the end of Arandur. The guy was barely in the series as it was. No wonder he was so upset on the red carpet. Right, you know, sometimes we just get parked and it doesn't mean it doesn't resonate through the series, even though they have no scenes. I did tell that Mordor wench to shut up though, didn't I? That, that was cool as he bleeds out on the floor. Meanwhile, the orcs are just pulling rocks out of, the, out of the wall by hand now because nobody on the wall is shooting them. And so they breach the it. city. Elrond gets to watch his, the rest of his army die and decides to do absolutely nothing about it. Just sitting there like a lonely arse. If only I got to ban Galadriel one more time. Like Starship Troopers. It's okay, Galadriel, because I got to have you. <laughs> Of course, because Galadriel basically told Adar her entire plan, he knows where the ring is. And so despite Alrond trying to stab him, he just grabs his wrist and turns it over because he has super strength, apparently. <laughs> grabs him by the throat before yeeting him to the ground. Don't know why he didn't kill him, to be honest. And takes his ring. Which, let's face it, it's not the first time a malformed elf has taken Elrond's ring. Seems like Galadriel's been destroying it for quite a while. And we have reached peak fast with this, where it's kind of what happened with Wheel of Tart. It's just funny now. Everyone's an idiot. All the plans are stupid. Nothing makes sense. Sauron's supposed to be a trickster god when he turns out, oh, I could have just controlled you all the time. But instead, I just decided to talk to you and then tell you about how actually everything was your fault. And I just wanted to paradise, despite the fact that everything burned burns around me. Nothing makes sense, but they're desperately trying for depth that they don't know how to provide, because their fundamental value is equality, where good and evil are the same. Everything is grey, because nothing has any kind of hierarchy to it. And without that hierarchy, you have no depth. Everything's the same. It's equal and shallow, and that's what the show is. And it can't be anything else, because the people behind it don't have anything else to them. Their worldview isn't any more complex. And so you end up with a show where you can pick it apart, like the elves don't have any kind of fighting skills and it shows. They can't even match what happened in movies decades ago. You can laugh as all the innuendos is just everybody shipping each other, like getting with somebody's mother whose daughter you're going to marry in the future. And you have to have stupid coincidences like, why does Adar stab Elrond even though he's got him there? Well, can't, because he's got to appear in the later books. And so the Hello. plot doesn't make sense. It was never meant to. Things happen this way because they have to happen way. this way. And the writers didn't create characters that would have inevitably led to this situation. And so they end up acting out of character because because the events go against their character. This is how a dark can care about his babies, but also send them to war for no reason. And I remember the original reviews that said this was the best episode, but having seen all the ones up to that point, that's only true if you forget the other six, which admittedly I can fully understand if people did. But if you are tracking the story, the motivations and the personalities of the character, this entire episode was nonsense. And people miss out obvious information just because they think it will cause more drama. Like Gladwell, not telling Hella Grimble, Halbrand or Sarah, or Hella Brim not telling Galadriel that those nine rings are evil, they need to be destroyed because they've got Sauron's blood in them, or him making them, because Sauron asked him to, for no reason whatsoever. The only reason to make them would be to give them to Sauron to save the city, but he had no intention of giving them to him. And it's that complete lackadaisical approach to their own plot, which really underpins the entire thing not being believable. But it matters. To make for the cast matter. Who the elves are matter. Their personalities matter, not in rings of power. But those are just my thoughts. What are yours? Let me know down in the comments below. Like the video, like the video. Video. Subscribe. More videos like this in the future, and I will see you in the next one. Bye yeah, bye. Orders. Lumberjack. Bronx. Helping them see constellations and planets through all of New York's light pollution using this high quality telescope. But until just this week, our friend Jupiter Joe had been harboring a dark secret. One he had been keeping for the past 22 years. One that will make you see in a very different light. One that will make you sick to your stomach. On February 24, 1999, Minnie Soriano was on her way home from the hospital in the Bronx. Unfortunately, she never made it back to her apartment. Halfway through her journey, she was snatched by a then 27-year-old Jupiter Joe who proceeded to do unspeakable things to her before strangling her and hiding her body in a dumpster. Minnie's remains wouldn't be found for another four days. She was just 13. For 22 years, investigators were left scratching their heads. All they had to work with was a small sample of their unknown killer's DNA left behind on Minnie's sweater. Every time they ran this sample through their system, it came back with zero matches. This was likely the first and only time their man had struck. 
meaning his DNA profile wasn't on record. For a time, the police believed that the person responsible was either Minnie's stepfather or a handyman that worked at their apartment building, but both of them had solid alibis. Anyone with even a remote connection to Minnie or her family were questioned, then questioned again. There was nothing to link any of them to her demise. Minnie herself had a sweet and caring disposition and was known as the Cinderella of her apartment block. Nobody held a grudge against her or her family. Needless to say, with no suspects and very little evidence to work with, the case quickly went cold. Now it used to be that if you randomly killed a complete stranger, there'd basically be no way to link you to the crime, provided you didn't have any DNA evidence on file. Well, I'm happy to say that's changing. New advances Hello. in forensic science have made it possible Hello. to track down perps who don't have any DNA on record. And that's exactly how Jupiter yes, Joe's I'll past misdeed came to light. Using new and advanced Order, familial DNA matching technology, forensic experts were able to map their elusive killer's family tree. This technique doesn't require there to be a 100% identical profile on record, but instead identifies partial matches thus linking the suspect to family members already in the DNA database. Their search came back with a strong match. A male whose DNA was so similar to the birds that they must have been the father of the father. From there, they just had to find that man's son, Joseph Martinez, aka Jupiter I'm Joe. Ready. As it turns out, Joe had lived in the same apartment building as Minnie and her family back in 1999. Despite having been questioned back when the case was still fresh, he was never considered a suspect. Now, with all eyes on him, officers took a sample of his DNA. It matched perfectly with the sample found at the scene back in 99. On November 30th of this year, Joe was taken into custody. A historic arrest, considering it marks the first time the NYPD has used partial DNA matching to identify a bird. Though a now 49-year-old Joe has yet to stand by, with so much evidence against him, it's safe to say this case has finally been solved. For 22 years, he believed he had gotten away with murder. Well, I'm glad to say, justice finally caught up with him. This is 21-year-old University of Virginia student. Otto Warmbier. In early 2016, Hello, Otto farmer. was scheduled to visit Hong Kong as a part of a UVA study abroad program. But Otto had his heart set on visiting a very different Asian country whilst en route. He contacted Young Pioneer Tours, a Chinese-based adventure tour company, who promised destinations your mother would rather you stayed away from. Such places included the irradiated ruins of Pripyat, the wide, rocky frontiers of Afghanistan, and also Otto's desired travel destination, the Hermit Kingdom of North Korea. Otto arrived in North Korea's capital, Pyongyang, on the 29th of December 2015. His tour group included 10 other American citizens, as well as a little puddly named Danny Graham. Danny remembers that the tour group were a like-minded band, mostly young people, and despite the risky location, there was an overwhelming atmosphere, fun and exciting. Naturally, all tour groups that enter Pyongyang are strictly controlled by the North Korean government. But during the New Year tours, the Kim regime tries to show its guests that it parties just as heartily as the next country and plies the tourists with vast amounts of booze. Danny Grattan remembers the group drank very heavily in Pyongyang's one and only hotel for foreign guests. However, there is one floor of the Yangakdo International Hotel that is forbidden to foreigners. The so-called secret fifth floor that houses the hotel staff. The fifth floor is devoid of any kind of luxury, with bare floors and grey painted walls. The only colour comes from propaganda posters that line the walls. Foreign knowledge of the floor's existence has given rise to a kind of fifth floor challenge, daring tourists to venture into the forbidden hallways, sometimes just to peek, sometimes to take a few pictures. Those who are caught usually just receive a warning or have their cell phones seized. But at exactly 1.57am on New Year's Day, a man, purported to be Otto Warmbier, was caught on camera entering the forbidden floor. This figure supposedly tried to steal one of the propaganda posters, then left empty-handed. 
Just over 24 hours later, Otto and the rest of the tour group were sitting in the departure lounge of Pyongyang Airport, awaiting their flight back to Beijing. Danny Grattan remembers swapping contact details with Otto, only to see a gang of North Korean officials approaching with a look of urgency about them. Otto Frederick Warmbier, one of them said. Please, come with us. Well, that's the last time we'll ever see you again, Danny half-joked. But Otto didn't look scared at all. In fact, he gave a kind of half-smile as he was led away. The group briefly awaited his return, but when their plane was ordered to take off without him, they began to fear the worst. Although North Korea admitted to detaining Otto, it took them six weeks to announce their reasons for doing so. That reason being subversion. According to the group that Otto was with, he wasn't even in the hotel that night, and the person in the CCTV footage didn't even resemble him. Still, the North Koreans went ahead with the trial. The picture you're looking at is of Otto's first public appearance since his arrest, one in which he begged Kim Jong-un's forgiveness. It was a complete show trial. Otto gave a coached confession, admitting to trying to take the poster, pretty much just reading from a script. If he played along, he was told, he'd be let go with a warning. At this point though, it does appear that he broke character, genuinely pleading for his life. It was widely believed that the US State Department would secure Otto's release before sentencing. However, the North Koreans shocked the world by condemning him to 15 years hard labor. The US continued to demand Otto's release, and after a while, the North Koreans eventually gave in when things started getting heated. However, when Otto was delivered back to America, he was severely brain damaged and in a vegetative state. Everyone was horrified. The North Koreans claimed that Otto had fallen into a coma after contracting botulism shortly after his trial, possibly as a result of eating rotten food. This is doubtful. As one doctor put it, for somebody who had supposedly been bedridden for more than a year, his body was in excellent condition. In Otto's case, there are definitely things the North Koreans aren't telling us. Having lost all hope, Cynthia and Fred Warmbier requested that Otto's feeding tube be removed. He passed away on the 19th of June, 2017. His story constitutes a terrifying cautionary tale that speaks to the mercilessness and brutality of the Kim regime. Looking at this photo of Otto begging for mercy, knowing he wasn't going to get any, it's truly haunting stuff. Twenty-five-year-old Li Xiehua, better known online as Chris Li, is, or perhaps was, a Chinese journalist and content creator with almost 70,000 YouTube subscribers. Prior to making his videos, he worked for CCTV, China's biggest state-run news channel. Now if you know anything about China, it's that freedom of expression isn't high on their to-do list, and those who either criticise the government or otherwise make it look bad are often silenced. When Chris became disillusioned by the amount of censorship going on at CCTV, he of course decided to quit, and instead began filming his own informative videos, this time documenting the truth and giving his own honest opinions. If you head over to Chris's channel, you'll see that he only has seven videos. The first four deal with… let's call it the current global situation, the Big C. They were all uploaded between the 12th and 25th of February 2020 so just when the severity of the situation was dawning on us all. He filmed these videos at the epicenter of this whole thing, Ground Zero, Wuhan, you all know where. Chris had heard through the grapevine that a prominent lawyer named Cheng Qushi had started blogging about conditions in the city. While reporting there, Chen had mysteriously disappeared, and to this day, hasn't been seen or heard from again. Believing there was some type of cover-up going on, and that Chen had been permanently silenced by the state, Chris travelled into the red zone to uncover the truth. With the help of some locals, he was able to find an apartment in the city and got himself a vehicle. From there, he began blogging. Chris took his camera to the streets, conducting interviews, visiting hospitals, and exposing the failures of his government to the entire world 
and showing how they were intentionally concealing what was going on there. But he was saying too much, showing too much, and it wasn't long before the strong hand of the government came knocking. You don't have to be able to read Mandarin to get the meaning behind Chris's first and only YouTube short. This live video, entitled SOS, is only 30 seconds long and shows a clearly terrified Chris as he travels down the motorway. He states that moments prior, a white SUV was driving directly at him down the wrong side of the road. Apparently, it suddenly swerved in front of his vehicle in an attempt to block his path and the men inside told him to surrender. He instead hit the accelerator, and the SUV was now following him. Friends, I'm on the road right now, being pursued and chased by state authorities who are in an unmarked van. The only thing I can do right now is make this video. I'm in Wuhan. I'm driving very fast, and they're chasing me. Pray for me. Soon after uploading this, Chris made it back to his apartment and immediately began live streaming. The stream lasted for nearly four hours, the majority of that time, the screen remained black as Chris sat in the dark, lights off, not making a sound, hoping the men chasing him would think he wasn't home. At various points, you can hear them outside, knocking on his door. After hiding in the dark for over three hours, a distressed Chris turns on the lights and addresses his viewers. Oh, I predicted this would most likely happen, but I never knew they'd find me so quick. I'm not going to try and escape, because there's no use now. I just think it's funny. Before coming to Wuhan, after I resigned from CCTV, I had a long talk with my producer. It feels so unreal. Before, when I turned on the camera to talk, it was for others. Today, I can finally speak my own thoughts. But these own thoughts will probably become my final speech. At the very end of the stream, as Chris's internet connection gets weaker and more patchy, he begins talking to the men outside his apartment, explaining why it's important for a journalist to report the truth and appealing to their decency. He then opens the door. Two men enter the apartment, and the video ends abruptly. For two months after that, Chris was missing. He didn't make any more videos, and his viewers feared the worst. Then, on April 22nd, 2020, after two months of silence, Chris suddenly uploaded a six-minute video, titled, I'm Chris, here is something about me since February 26th. February 26th was the day he disappeared. This video seemed completely out of character. The style of the video was totally different from all of his other uploads, as was his neutral tone. And despite being critical of the CCP in the past, now he was singing their praises and denouncing himself. He said that he was fine, and that he had been treated very well. The whole thing seemed oddly scripted, like Chris was being forced by the state to make this video against his will. He just stands in the center of the screen, in some blank, featureless room, robotically delivering his message. Chris even ended the video with a strange quote from the Book of Documents. The setting, the delivery, everything about this video makes you wonder who's standing just off screen. Since that final video, Chris hasn't uploaded any new content, and hasn't made any posts on his social media accounts either. He simply vanished from the internet. With China's dodgy human rights track record, many have become concerned for Chris's safety and well-being, myself included. Many suspect he's been placed in a re-education camp. Others fear something even worse might have happened to him. But what Chris did was incredibly important. He exposed the truth about the global situation at a time when true reports out of China were hard to come by. He was brave enough to speak out, and I fear he may have paid dearly for that.
If you're looking for some weird videos that give off strong Uncanny Valley vibes, there's a channel on YouTube called Floresita Dreams. Let's take a scroll down their homepage, and... Oh, okay, some of these thumbnails are a bit strange. <laughs> yeah, this channel's a bit of a trip, and that's even before watching one of their videos. If you decide to go that far, then things only get more bizarre. Soy la chavesa y ya me contó mi marido el estupidísimo de ti, niñato del metro de Valencia, que andas molestando a los ancianos y al ver a mi topaz... All of their uploads are very cryptic. It doesn't help that they're all in Spanish either. Still, I don't think you need to be bilingual to appreciate just how weird this content is. Strange images, unsettling sounds, a million questions. But as much as I, and I'm sure you, can appreciate the creepiness of all of these weird images and sounds, there's actually more going on under the surface in these videos. Well, in one of the videos at least. They're most popular. A video titled, Kineteca del Patron, Celine Delgado. I don't recommend you watch this video late at night by yourself. There are some really disturbing images in it that I'm not going to show here, but they're certainly not for the faint of heart, so stay away if you're not into that. But without a knowledge of Spanish or an understanding of the context, it would be easy to write this whole video off as some sort of creepy art project designed to leave a bad taste in your mouth. Though there's definitely some intentional shock value here, this video actually puts forward an interesting hypothesis. First, some backstory. Televisa is a Mexican multimedia company that effectively has a monopoly on the nation's TV industry. Back in the 90s and into the 2000s, they played this segment on Channel 5 called Servicio a la Comunidad, a community service broadcast that would play in between shows throughout the day. The whole thing was designed to help find people that had disappeared, very similar to an Amber Alert. During each segment, the names and faces of missing people would be displayed one by one, and the announcer would tell you their last known location. The show is still remembered and talked about to this day, mostly by those who grew up watching it when they were young. In fact, the broadcasts were targeted at a younger audience. It played during the commercial breaks of cartoons and other family-friendly shows, and given the bleak and somber nature of the announcements, it scared a lot of young viewers. One minute, they'd be immersed in their favorite show, not a care in the world. Then, they'd be interrupted by this. XHGC Canal 5, al servicio de la comunidad. Pedimos ayuda para localizar a Víctor Gama Tavera, de 20 años de edad. Se ignora su paradero desde el 28 de mayo del año 2000. Esteban Mendoza Juárez, de 24 años, se ignora su paradero desde el 29 de abril. Va en compañía del menor Víctor Daniel Mendoza Rodríguez. Cristian Vélez Zamudio. Va en compañía de los menores Erika Cecilia y Cristian Daniel Vélez Ávila. Cualquier informe a los teléfonos de Canal 5. As one YouTube user noted in the comment section of this broadcast, there you were, sitting on the couch, sipping a glass of choco milk at 8 or 9 a.m., when the shrill sounds of cartoons and ads for toys and junk food were suddenly interrupted by an agonizing, ominous silence. The voice of the announcer, forever recorded in your memories, describing unknown persons, giving you dates, and describing disappearances. Can people really get lost for so long? All of the while, that ominous silence, gloomy and empty, made your blood run cold, as a wave of questions and fears possessed your mind. What if that happened to me, or to my mum, or my dad, or some other member of my family? No, that couldn't happen to me, right? So that was the whole premise of the segment. Missing people, appeals for information, and if you went missing in Mexico, there was a decent sized chance that your face would pop up in one of these broadcasts. The most famous face to air during Serbifico a la Comunidad was undoubtedly Saline Delgado Lopez. During its long television run, Saline featured in almost every iteration of Serbifico a la Comunidad. The weird thing was, only this one photo of her was ever used. A low quality, grainy image set against a white background. Little information was ever told about her, other than the fact that she was 18 and disappeared in Mexico City. 
From the beginning, a lot of viewers agreed that there was something off about this photo. Not everyone could quite articulate what it was exactly, but there was something unsettling about Selene, and the fact that her face popped up every so often meant that it stuck with them. This later sparked several rumors about her, including the theory explored in Floricita Dream's video, that Selene Delgado wasn't a real person. The grainy picture, combined with her relatively generic facial features, led many to speculate that Selene's photo was computer-generated. As these rumors started gaining traction, people began digging deeper. Strangely, no public record of any missing person named Selene Delgado Lopez could be found. After that got out, this theory became a full-blown Mexican urban legend, and as the internet became more widespread, so too did the theory that Selena Delgado never existed. To help spread the legend further, people started posting hoax videos online like this. This image was made around the same time Selena reportedly disappeared. It's actually a composite of Derek Todd Lee, the Baton Rouge Slayer, but has since become associated with Selene. Due to the facial proportions of this composite being very similar to that of Selene's face, some have suggested that this was one of the templates used to digitally generate Selene's photo. Floricita Dreams makes the same claim. They supposedly prove this by using a 3D modeling program, demonstrating that Selene's face was made from an amalgamation of other images both real people and other composites. According to them, Selena's face is too similar to these images to be real, and that her photo was constructed using features from various faces. If that's true, then that means the Channel 5 broadcasters intentionally chose to include this fake person in their segment. Selena's picture certainly left a lasting impression on everyone who saw it, so it's possible it was included as a sort of warning to all of their young viewers. Stay vigilant and safe. Personally, I'm not sure this theory holds up. I mean, sure, Selena's face is pretty generic, but by definition, so are most people's. And yeah, the camera is pretty terrible. But this was the 90s, and poorer Mexican families at the time wouldn't have had access to high-quality cameras. There was no public record of Selena going missing, sure, but since 1964, a staggering 214,000 people have disappeared in Mexico. It's possible her records were either lost, misplaced, or not even filed in the first place. The authorities may have simply had too much else going on to bother with her. Not to mention, with so many missing people in Mexico, it's not like Channel 5 had to resort to making up stories and lying to drum up attention for their channel... Oh dear. So as it turns out, Channel 5's Twitter page caused quite a stir last year, when, for a while, they began posting extremely creepy videos at around 3am every night, only to delete them a few hours later. <laughs> So that's some really strange content for a professional company's Twitter page to be posting. But what really caught everyone's attention was when they posted this, captioned, Selene, obviously a reference to Selene Delgado. Now clearly this was all a marketing tactic, with the creepy videos all being distorted versions of other clips found online, some more famous than others. Channel 5 themselves are clearly aware of the Selene mystery, and used her name to get on Twitter's trending page. But what this goes to show is that Channel 5 aren't exactly above this type of ploy, making it more plausible that they faked the image of Selene back in the 90s, just like Floricita Dreams asserts. Whatever the truth behind the Selene Delgado mystery, her story's been very well known in Spanish-speaking internet communities for a long time. However, a fairly recent development brought the urban legend to the attention of the rest of the world. So if you go onto Facebook right now and search the name Selene Delgado Lopez, this account pops up. 
The woman in this photo sort of resembles an aged up version of the original, grainy photo of Selene. Intrigued users clicked on her profile, curious if this might be the real Selene. Was she real after all? And if so, was she alive? To their horror, everyone who clicked on their profile realized they were already friends with her, despite never having added her in the first place. More bizarrely, there was no option to unfriend her. People started claiming that she was friends with everyone on Facebook, and began saying that the profile was haunted or otherwise nefarious. The account's profile picture ended up being shared more than 126,000 times by Spoot users, showing just how far this rumor spread. In reality, this was obviously all bull. This Selena Delgado was simply an ordinary woman who happened to share the same name as our subject. This Selene had simply changed her Facebook privacy settings, hiding the add friend button. She wasn't everyone's friend on Facebook after all. It's actually impossible to have more than 5,000 friends on the site. After being bombarded with messages, this poor woman had to reply to some, saying, I am not missing, nor have I ever been. I'm at home with my family and fine. To be honest, I'm not even sure how this offshoot of the Delgado mystery became so popular. I guess one day, someone just saw that there was no add friend button, checked the woman's name, and linked it to the popular Mexican legend. Then, boom, hysteria spread. Seriously, do people not know you can change your settings on Facebook? Since then, there have been no new developments, and the truth about the original Delgado broadcast remains shrouded in mystery. Was she a real person, who sadly vanished without a trace, never to be seen again, her family left without closure? and her memory reduced to a slew of fake urban legends? Or did she never exist in the first place, her face a mixture of several others combined, designed to either scare youngsters into keeping their guards up, or to get people talking about Channel 5? I doubt we'll ever have any definitive proof one way or the other to be honest. I mean, personally, I suspect the former, but hope for the latter. The only thing I do know is that uh, this image, yeah, that's gonna stay in there for a while. Good night. In January of 1983, a group of young boys were playing in a wooded area on Hoap Mountain near Seoul, South Korea. Little did they know, they were about to make a grisly discovery. One of the youngsters pointed out a mannequin lying in a pile of leaves in the distance, an odd thing to be in the middle of the woods. As they drew closer, they realized it wasn't a mannequin at all. It was the corpse of a young woman, frozen stiff with rigor mortis. Whoever she was, the anguished expression on her face suggested that she had died in great pain. Morticians estimated that she'd been dead for at least a month when the boys found her. Her fingerprints identified her as 24-year-old Kyung Hee Kim, a barbershop worker from the city. In parts of Asia, there are certain barbershops that offer more than just haircuts and provide other services to their male clientele. Let's put it like that. Well, it was at one such barbershop that Miss Kim worked at. She needed the money, you see. With no external injuries to speak of, it was determined that Miss Kim had died from poisoning. It seemed unlikely that she would climb up Mount Hoa in the middle of winter just to take her own life. And given the nature of her work and the type of customers it attracted, police began their investigation at the barbershop. One of Kim's most loyal customers was a 42-year-old man named Dong Sik Lee, a plumber by trade. Lee's true passion, however, was photography. He'd won numerous awards for his work, something he couldn't help but bring up in conversation, and he often held private photo exhibitions for other enthusiasts. Detectives surprised Mr. Lee by knocking on his door one evening and asking him about the death of Miss Kim. Mr. Lee said that he didn't know anything about it, that he only enjoyed making use of Kim's professional services, and nothing more. Naturally, he couldn't help but bring up the fact that he was an award-winning amateur photographer. That admission proved to be his downfall. The investigators asked if they could see some of his pictures. Lee said he didn't have much time, but the investigators insisted. Lee capitulated and led them into the room where he kept his photos. Among all of these hundreds of photos, were images of scantily clad women posing as murder victims. 
the investigators questioned me about, to which he replied, I have an affection for cadavers. Well, the photos were obviously staged. These weren't pictures of real dead men. Lee's second wife was also in one of the photos, pretending to be dead, and in reality, she was alive and well. Clearly Lee was just a weird guy who viewed death as art, and was playing out his bizarre fantasy with paid models. But just as they were finishing up, one of the investigators noticed Lee stealthily trying to pocket one of the photos. He grabbed it from Lee's hand before sharing it with his colleagues. One by one, the detectives examined it and looked up at each other with knowing expressions. There was no mistaking it. It showed what appeared to be a dead Miss Kim lying on a pile of leaves wearing the same clothes she had been found in. They immediately searched Lee's basement and found 20 even more disturbing photos. They were all of Miss Kim, and they were time sequenced, showing her writhing on the ground, clutching at her chest, and gasping for air. They'd been taken as she lay dying. Lee was immediately taken into custody. Of course, he maintained that he hadn't taken Miss Kim's life, and that she was just another model posing for the camera. He admitted that he had gone up to Ho'op Mountain with Miss Kim, but that it was just for a photo shoot. He said he left the mountain without me, and that someone else must have come along after that and taken her life. Very coincidental. Well, it was obvious to everyone that playing pretend wasn't doing it for Mr. Lee anymore. He had taken things a step further and decided to live out his dark, twisted fantasy. When forensic specialists zoomed in on the photos of Miss Kim, they noticed that the hair on her skin was gradually drooping more and more in each consecutive picture, something that happens as a person perishes. That proved that she wasn't just acting. As it turns out, Lee had manipulated Miss Kim during one of his regular sessions at the barbershop. He had gone there many times over the course of three weeks and charmed her with stories about the award-winning photos he had taken, the amazing exhibitions he had put on, and the models he had made famous. Oh, by the way, Miss Kim, You'd make a great subject yourself. I bet I could make you famous too. After regular visits, he had gained Miss Kim's trust. So, when he invited her to a private photo shoot up on Mount Hoa, she of course said yes. This could be her big break, her chance to finally live a decent life. On December 14th, 1982, the pair walked to that secluded area of the woods for Miss Kim's first and last portrait session. As Lee set up his camera, he remarked how chilly it was that day, and offered him a tablet, which he said was cold medicine. It'll prevent you from getting sick, he told her. Trust me. Well, she did, and gulped down one of the pills. But it wasn't cold medicine at all. The capsule actually contained potassium side. It wasn't long before her insides began aching. Then, burn. As she fell down into the leaves, Lee was ready and waiting with his camera. As she begged for help, all he did was take her picture again and again. The last thing she likely saw was the camera's flash before everything went black. Four years later, Mr. Lee's own world faded to black too when he was executed on May 27, 1986. Before his sentence was carried out, Lee stated, the way a human being dies, it's art. I only took artistic photographs. This is the reconstructed face of Bitter Creek Betty, also known as Rose Doe, due to the distinctive rose tattoo on her chest. On March 1st, 1992, a truck driver in Sweetwater, Wyoming, came across what he thought were two trash bags at the bottom of an embankment on the side of the road. As he examined them from a distance, he realized what he was actually looking at. The body of a woman, face down in the snow, completely clothless. He quickly radioed in his discovery. Although she'd been dead for between one and five months before being found, all the snow meant that Bitter Creek Betty had stayed well preserved. In fact, she was so thoroughly frozen that it took a full 24 hours for her remains to thaw out. 
after which the coroners made some gruesome discoveries. They determined that the unknown woman had likely been killed with an ice pack, which had been thrust up into her left nostril. Other signs of physical trauma were also present around her neck and face. Given that Betty was found in Bitter Creek, an area just off the I-80, America's busiest east to west highway, investigators theorized that her body had hastily been tossed from a transport truck. Betty's fingerprints were scanned, but no matches were found. As such, this composite was created to show what Betty may have looked like when she was alive. A post-mortem photo with drawn on eyes was also released, but it's quite eerie to look at, so I won't show that here. Regardless, believe me when I say that this is one of the most police sketches actually very After examining her DNA, forensic showed that this huge sketch was of South American and European descent. She was 5 foot 8, weighed around 125 to 130 pounds, and was between 24 and 32 years old. Though she had no clothes on when she was found, she was wearing some jewellery, notably a gold necklace and a gold wedding ring on her left ring. That strongly suggests that our doe had a husband, making it stranger that nobody had come forward to claim her remains, or even report her missing. A caesarean scar on her abdomen indicated that she had also given birth at least once in her lifetime. As previously stated, she had a distinctive rose tattoo with Chinese lettering on the stem. This tattoo was traced to a business in Tucson, Arizona. The artist underwent hypnosis to help the detectives with their investigation. Through this method, he was able to remember that Ardo had come into the store in June 1991, that she was a Hispanic hitchhiker who spoke without an accent, and that she'd been wearing a brown dress detailed with the yellow flowers. That dress was depicted in her sketch. After Betty Creek Betty's remains were examined, her case was linked to another unidentified murder victim, Utah's Sheridan County Jane Doe. DNA found at both scenes suggested that a serial killer with blood type O was responsible for their slayings. That development later proved hugely significant. 28 years after Betty's body was found, in May of 2020, a long haul truck driver named Clark Perry Baldwin was arrested not only for her slaying, but also for taking the lives of Sheridan County Jane Doe and a Tennessee woman named Pamela Gordon. Pamela was pregnant at the time she was slain, and as such, the 59-year-old was charged with four counts of first degree. His trial is still in trouble. It's likely that Baldwin took the lives of many other women during his active years, and a few other Jane Doe cases, similar to Bitter Creek Betty's, are now being reinvestigated. Among them, North Carolina's Jane Doe, who was also found down 15 feet down the embankment along the I-40. Her shoes have been taken as some sort of sick souvenir. Though it seems likely the perp in Bitter Creek Betty's story has been found and will face justice, her identity still remains a mystery. Thus far, nine people have been ruled out as possibilities. It's strange to think that somewhere out there, this woman had a husband and a child, but her body still remains unclaimed. And sure, they may have become estranged prior to her demise. Maybe they even passed away before that point too. But it just seems like somebody out there must know who she was. Why haven't they come forward? Why was she never reported missing? On the bright side, of all the cases I've covered and will cover in this video, Betty's is by far the most likely to be solved. More than a quarter of a century has passed since Windy Point Jane Doe's body was found in Colorado, and all these years later, her true name still remains unknown. Back in 1994, her skeletal remains were found scattered above Divine Road near Windy Point Campground. For all anyone knows, they could have been left there years prior, with nobody ever coming across them. In her case, foul play was instantly suspected. Forensic scientists did their best to create this image of what Jane Doe may have looked like in life. Yeah, unfortunately the technology wasn't quite there at the time. I'm getting some strong Uncanny Valley vibes off this one. For years, this was the best that detectives had to work with, and although the reconstruction actually generated a few calls, none of them led anywhere. Without the woman's identity, or anything else to work with, there was little the investigators could do. Well, that was a long time ago, and technology has improved leaps and bounds since then. 
Nowadays, EFITs can be generated using familial DNA collected from genealogy sites like 23andMe or Ancestry DNA. By analyzing the DNA of people distantly related to John and Jane Doe's, far more accurate composites can be created to show us what the victims may have looked like in life. In May of 2019, such an EFIT was created for Windy Point Jane Doe, using only the DNA collected from her bones. As you can see, the updated EFIT is quite different from the original. With these new advancements, forensic experts were also able to conclude that she was between 35 and 45 years old when she died, that she was 5 foot 4 inches tall, and that she was Caucasian, with auburn coloured hair. Though this new image is yet to help authorities uncover Windy Point's true identity, I've included this one to show just how much better these reconstructions are getting, how technology is helping to give new life to the long dead, and how even when we can't give a doe back their name, we can at least give them back a face. In northeast Hong Kong, there's a popular recreational area called Sai Kung. It's famous for its hiking spots, beaches, and for its inordinate number of disappearances and deaths. Sai Kung itself isn't particularly big, but the natural beauty of the peninsula has basically remained untouched, and it's full of long and winding trails, so it's easier to see how people might get lost there. That being said, there are signs and markers all along the hiking routes, and each signpost has its own unique set of coordinates written on it. If you were to get lost somewhere, or feel like you were too weak to continue your hike, all you'd have to do is call for help, state the coordinates on the nearest sign, and help would be on the way. That makes it all the weirder that so many people have vanished or perished while exploring Sai Kung, especially when you consider the mysterious circumstances surrounding each incident. In September of 2009, an off-duty police officer was out hiking alone in Sai Kung. He called the emergency services for help and told the operator that he was lost and needed to be rescued. Thankfully, he was right next to one of the marked signposts, so he read off its coordinates to the operator. Strangely, the coordinates he provided didn't match with any on record, meaning the operator had no idea where the officer actually was. The call then ended abruptly, and despite an extensive search and rescue effort, the lost officer was never seen or heard from again. To this day, his whereabouts, or more accurately, the whereabouts of his body, remain a mystery. This incident quickly captured the public's imagination, and a movie was even made about the officer's disappearance, called Missing. His mysterious vanishing didn't surprise some locals, however. It had long been believed that Sai Kung was an ominous place. According to Cantonese folklore, the peninsula was home to some sort of otherworldly portal or barrier, which one should never cross. Only one month after the officer went missing, a male and four females were out hiking in the same area. The male became tired and told the women to go ahead, said that he'd catch up. He never did. The women went back to look for him, but found no trace of their missing friend. Two days later, his body showed up next to the trail where they had been searching. His cause of death remains unclear to this day. This man was a Boy Scout troop leader, and knew his way around nature very well, adding to the bizarreness of his demise. Later that same year, a bus driver was out hiking alone in Sai Kung. When he didn't return home that day, his family tried calling his phone to check that he was okay. To their surprise, a fisherman answered it, saying that he had found the phone in a river. The bus driver was never found. In 2011, another man called the emergency services, saying that he was lost on a Sai Kung hiking trail. Just like the lost officer before him, his call suddenly disconnected, and he was never seen or heard from again. A number of other strange deaths have occurred on the Sai Kung Peninsula, dating all the way back to 2005, right up to more recent incidents in 2019 and even 2020. In each of these instances, a lone male's body was found, resting beside a trail. Foul play is suspected in at least one of these cases, but for the most part, there's been little evidence to suggest that there's a serial killer loose on Sai Kung, and the majority of these deaths have been attributed to accidental falls. But what about the people who have completely disappeared? The Sai Kung hiking trails are all clearly marked, well maintained, and aren't known to be treacherous routes. 
most of the dead and missing were experienced hikers, and were knowledgeable about the area, and about navigation and basic survival skills. But here's the most interesting part. There is an account from a man named Chung, who became lost in Sai Kung, but actually managed to make it out alive. According to Chung, he was out hiking in the area, when he suddenly and inexplicably lost consciousness. He awoke at 8pm, and tried to get back to civilization, but in his own words, said that. When I tried to leave, it was weird. No matter how far I walked, I never got any closer to getting out. On his second day lost in the wilderness, he saw two people and shouted out to them. They didn't react to him, but they both disappeared right in front of his eyes. After resting for a while, he saw another figure come running right out of the tree line. He tried chasing after them, hoping they might help him. I chased that man all the way down, said Chung. He changed into people I knew, and people I didn't know during that chase. But when I caught up, they all disappeared. Exhausted, Chung fell asleep. When he awoke on the third day, he noticed that several items he had been carrying had disappeared. He also realized that his surroundings had changed, and that he wasn't where he had fallen asleep the previous night. He described the area as having the vibe of an old graveyard, and during that day, he apparently saw many people that all disappeared as he reached out to them. On the fourth day, he awoke to find his surroundings had changed yet again, and that the rocks around him were all making a strange, rumbling noise. He made his way down the trail in front of him, and all the while, the rocks continued to rumble. Eventually, he ran into a young guy from Thailand. Difference was, this guy didn't disappear. He was real, and he lent Chung his cell phone to call for help. After four days, Chung finally emerged from the Sai Kung Mountains. One strange thing that he and his rescuers noticed was that Chung hadn't been bitten by any mosquitoes or other bugs during his whole ordeal. And this was June, and the mountains of Sai Kung were absolutely swarming with the little buggers, making his lack of bite marks extremely strange. A weird story to say the least, but what do you think? Did Chung and the less fortunate souls before him pass through the so-called Sai Kung Barrier and enter some other plane of existence, an alternate dimension? Or can his strange experiences be chalked up to dehydration and exhaustion? Is there some mysterious portal on the Hong Kong Peninsula, or are all of these deaths and disappearances simply the result of accidents? If so, whatever happened to the remains of the other experienced hikers who still haven't been found? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. It was September 26, 2014, a warm day in Iguala, Mexico. At approximately 6 p.m., more than 100 students from an all-male teacher training school arrived in the city, all of them in their late teens and early 20s. They were on their way to the capital, but made a brief stop in Iguala to commandeer a couple of buses. You see, these students weren't traveling to Mexico City to do a relaxing spot of sightseeing. They were on their way there to protest against the Talatelolco student massacre that took place in 1968. Students from their particular teacher training school were known for being politically active, and this commandeering of public buses was a time-honored, annual tradition. Each year, they'd take over two or three buses, drive north to Mexico City, and march against the injustices that had taken place in 1968 and in all the years since. Though quite annoying for anyone hoping to ride those particular buses that day, their behavior was generally tolerated by both the public and the police. And since they were using the buses for a good cause, and always returned the vehicles after each year's march, even the bus companies tolerated their annual escapades. As such, the borrowing of the buses had always been a relatively smooth and peaceful affair. But 2014's protest was set to begin and end very differently. Just like in all the previous years, the students joined together and took control of several public buses. They began their drive from Iguala to Mexico City, their spirits high. Little did they know what was about to hit them. While en route to the capital, police officers and federal military forces intercepted the buses and tried to force them to pull over. According to the authorities, it was because the students had stolen the buses. 
Strange, considering that they had tolerated their behavior in the past, and were quite familiar with this annual event. Their actual motive for pulling the buses over has been the topic of much debate over the past seven years, as have the events that happen next. According to the police, when they tried to stop the buses, the students accelerated and tried to escape. As such, the police gave chase and began to open fire on the buses to get them to stop, killing two students in the process. They also shot at another bus, which they must know for one that the students had taken, but which actually carried a local football team. The bus driver, one of the police, and a woman in a nearby taxi were all killed as a result of that mistake. The surviving students apparently jumped out of their vehicles at that point and fled into the surrounding hills. The following, one of the students who had tried to run, Julio Cesar Mondrago, was found lying in the dirt. His eyes had been gouged out and the skin on his face had been blamed to the bare bone. And this discovery made it obvious that there was something more sinister than police incompetence. But here's where the mystery comes in. More than a hundred students had gotten on those buses that they believed in in 2014. Two of them were gunned down by officers, and one of them was found mutilated the next day. That much we already know. But 43 of the survivors never returned, and were never seen or heard from again. After clashing with the law, they just vanished into thin air. For the past seven years, the citizens of Mexico have referred to these students as the 43, and have questioned, debated, and constantly protested for answers about what actually happened to them. 43 young men don't just disappear after all. Stories from the surviving students that actually did return from the house contradicted the police's official report. They said that when the authorities pulled their buses over, they complied. When their buses had come to a stop, armed officers and soldiers immediately began opening fire on them. There was reports panic on board the buses at this point with students dropping to the ground in order to avoid the bullets. That's why they had fled into the hills. Well, some of them at least. According to eyewitnesses, the police boarded the buses and rounded up the remaining students, those who had avoided the bullets but were too scared to run. They then forced them into police vehicles and drove off with them into the night. This convinced the public that the whole attack had been premeditated. Whatever had happened to the missing 43 students Nobody held that much hope that they were still alive, especially after bone fragments from two of them were discovered in the river. Some speculated that the mayor of Iguala City, Jose Luis Abarca, ordered the students to be captured for disrupting his wife's election campaign. He then handed them to a group of gangsters who killed them and burned their bodies in a local land. Their bone fragments were then tossed into the nearby river. And this theory indeed seemed plausible given that that same mayor had previously been accused of murdering an activist who stood against him. So many people believed that the mayor and his wife were responsible that they started referring to this version of events as the historical truth, despite independent forensic teams stating that it was unlikely. But, as of October 2021, we can throw the historical truth away and replace it with a real answer. As you might gather, the police were strongly involved. It appears they were partners in crime with the Aguari cartel. And just a couple of months ago, transcripts of text messages between the deputy police chief of Aguari and a local crime boss were released to the public. Messages that proved the authorities had worked alongside the cartel to round up, torture, and kill the missing students. In a cruel twist of fate, the buses the students had commandeered that day just so happened to be part of an operation the cartel was running and were secretly carrying a cargo of heroin. This cargo was about to be driven over the border into the US before the students inadvertently took control of the buses. Be clear, the students themselves had no idea what was actually hidden on the vehicles. It was just a case of taking the wrong bus at the wrong time. After the clash of the cops, deputy police Francisco Salgado Matadales message Gildardo Lopez as the beat, the local leader of the various students of the Salgado opened up. He had just rounded up some girls who had stolen his car. Reading through his text, the fate of the students becomes disturbing to me. Deputy Salgado told Crime Lopez he had 21 students held on the bus and 
17 meters from the corner of the cave. It's safe to assume that the latter group were among those who tried to run, but who weren't able to hide. The cartel leader Lucas replied by saying he wanted the more, and that he had events to terrorize them. They agreed to meet at a place for a scan to exchange the students, and they could be sold on with Lopez and bring enough men to handle the job. What exactly happened to the students after that remains a mystery, since aside from a few bone fragments, none of their bodies have ever been found. But from Lopez's texts, it's clear that they didn't die quickly. They had inconvenienced the wrong gangster. The people of Mexico still have a lot of questions about that horrible night in 2014. How were the students tortured? Where are their remains? If 21 students were captured on the bus and 17 more caught in a cave, that only makes 38. What about the remaining five? Since the real culprits behind the students vanishing have only just been unmasked, we don't have all of the answers just yet. But we can now say with confidence that the young men are dead. That both the police and the Iguala cartel were behind their massacre, and that the previous Mexican government were trying to cover up what had happened. Although not specifically stated in the messages, it appears as if the men were also involved in what happened and helped to apprehend the students. The cartel's influence runs deep. If there's one other thing we can say with confidence, it's that this was a callous and unnecessary waste of human life. The massacre was so It's enough to make your blood boil. Deputy Salgado has already been incarcerated for his role in this case. Crime boss Lopez was taken into custody but was released over a supposed failure of due process. Here it as we speak. With a population of just under 2 million, the North Vietnamese province of Thai Binh is one of the country's most unique and well-known regions. With its name meaning Great Peace, Thai Binh is essentially a distinct, cultural island, separated from its neighbours by the Great Red River Delta. Yet, Thai Binh is also the home of the Tram Pan, who, in 2002, fell victim to a mysterious and terrifying phenomenon. The Trams were essentially your average rural Vietnamese family with four different generations, all living under one roof. The head of the family, 65-year-old Tram Bang Ram, was the father of eight children, two of which had young families of their own. They made their living farming rice, and business was so good that the family were eventually able to construct a second house right next to their original one. This was a huge point of pride for Tram Bang Ram, who saw no greater purpose in life than to care for those who needed him. To the Trams, the future seemed bright, yet no one could have foreseen the darkness that was about to befall. According to Tran Quoc Viet, one of the family's eldest sons, the horror began when his younger brother commenced construction of the new family home. Just days after the work started, the family's cattle suddenly became ill. Not long after that, the remaining livestock seemed to collectively lose their minds. Pigs, ducks, chickens. They all went absolutely berserk. They fought amongst themselves and ran into solid concrete walls as if they were terrified by some unseen presence among them. Some think that the animals appeared to be foaming at the mouth as if afflicted by rabies. Yet there was simply no way that the rabies virus could spread that quickly between animals that had been sequestered into separate paddocks. One by one, the creatures fell and within just a matter of hours, all except for one of his younger brother's animals, a turnips and dog. And this one creature, a duck, seemed to be the only living thing to move to this mysterious plague. Within a few days, the same horrifying fate befell their parents' cattle, too. It was nothing short of a complete catastrophe, as almost all of the family's wealth was tied up in their livestock. Yet these animal deaths were only the beginning. The family's eldest son, Tram Van Bien, was probably the most successful of the Tran siblings. He already owned a house of his own, had a five-year-old son, and was described by all as a healthy young man in the prime of his life. But soon, Tram Van Bien began to suffer from mysterious pains, and after they failed to subside, he was admitted to hospital. 
frustrated doctors performed test after test, but they simply couldn't determine what was wrong with him. After a while, Tran found he was too weak to work, and soon began to display horrifyingly similar symptoms to those suffered by the livestock. That began burning at the moment and suffering intense seizures. But still, this doctor's failed to offer a logical explanation. Tragically, Tran Van Dien would pass away in mid-2002, leaving his wife a widow and his child fatherless. His death hit the family hard, and when the same bizarre symptoms were spotted in Van's surviving relatives, the psychological effects were almost as devastating as the physical. Tran Van Ren was haunted by his son's death and began drinking heavily. Yet the more he drank, the more his health deteriorated. And barely a month after Van Viet's death, Van Ren would also fall victim to the same violent seizures that took his son. Now two of the Tram family had fallen victim to the same mysterious disease. Three months after Van Rang's death, and in line with Vietnamese customs, four generations of the Tram family travelled out to the cemetery in which their former patriarch was buried, with the intention of performing a memorial ceremony. Among the congregation was Tran Van Ut, as well as Tran Van Ut's young son, who joined in mourning his deceased grandfather. Suddenly, the young boy collapsed. Right in front of his grandfather's grave, the child began to suffer the same heavy convulsions that killed Van Ren. He turned to her before throttling at the mouth. And then, just a few minutes of the episode commencing, he was dead. In the days that followed, three additional members of the Tram family would be rushed to hospital. The Tram mother, Nguyen Tai Dao, passed away during this period, suffering the same horrific symptoms as her departed son and husband. Tram Anut soon joined his son in death, his grief rendering him physically incapable of fighting off whatever terrifying illness had gripped his entire family. Tram Anut's wife was completely and utterly heartbroken and moved away from Tai Du in an attempt to escape her boundless grief. Yet, when she did, she noticed something curious. Her symptoms suddenly disappeared. By that point, word of the Tran family's five unexplained deaths had frightened and captivated the Vietnamese nation. Hundreds of medical professionals, police officers and scientists descended on the family's farm, all hoping to prevent any more unnecessary deaths. For four straight weeks, the Vietnamese investigation would pour over the site of the farm in hopes of solving the deadly mystery. They took water samples, air samples, samples of the food the family had been eating. The team even captured a variety of local wildlife species, vivisecting them in hopes of uncovering the phantom disease. Not even the Tram family themselves were above suspicion. And on more than one occasion, Quoc Viet, the last surviving Tran son, noticed he was being followed by police officers in plain clothes. The plot thickened even further when Pham Thi Thong, Van Rang's mother and the eldest member of the family, died after being rushed to hospital with the same symptoms as her relatives. During the course of her treatment, the nurses tending to her began suffering the same symptoms of the phantom disease. They complained of aches and pains in almost random places, and one nurse even passed out while on duty. In the end, the authorities' official explanation for the Tran family deaths was pesticide poisoning. Yet it should be noted that there was no trace of any deadly pesticides present in the bodies of the victims, nor on any of the land they owned. What's more, despite the official report blaming a pesticide for the deaths, it fails to name the exact substance which killed off the Tram family. So, with the official explanation for the family's sudden, mysterious, and no doubt painful deaths being viewed as absolute godswallop, many Vietnamese believe that their government is covering something up. And this has led to a number of conspiracy theories. The more outlandish revolve around evil snake spirits and other dark presences that supposedly call Tai Bin home. The more grounded center around the idea that the Tram family were little more than guinea pigs in a top secret chemical weapons test. Many have noted that the family's symptoms seem remarkably similar to some Cold War era nerve agents. And while this theory may well hold some credence, I think I may have a more feasible alternative. If you remember, the deaths of the family's livestock occurred almost immediately after the construction of their new home commenced. Vietnam is a relatively poor country, 
and although downtown Saigon might indulge in the same vapid glamour as LA or Paris or London, in the countryside, things are built to last. In all likelihood, the trans would have wanted their new home to last for generations, maybe even centuries. Therefore, it's safe to assume they wanted to lay solid, concrete foundations. Then, in the course of digging up the earth, maybe even laying a few water pipes, it's entirely possible that the trans inadvertently struck a mercury deposit, which somehow ended up contaminating their water supply. Just listen to this list of mercury poisoning symptoms. Abdominal pain, constipation, headaches, irritability, and tingling in the hands and feet. These line up almost to the letter with the tram family's symptoms. In severe cases, mercury poisoning can cause memory loss, anemia, seizures, coma, and even death. Again, the anemia lines up with Tram Van Beert being too weak to farm, and Tram Van Ut's son, who suffered a seizure so hard it snuffed out his young life. Another article on mercury poisoning states that, quote unquote, it causes almost 10% of intellectual disability of otherwise unknown cause and can result in behavioural problems. This accounts for why the Tram family were so mystified by their phantom affliction. It was messing with their brains so much that they didn't know what to look for, or even how to look for it. Then there are the two nurses who had aches and bouts of fainting just from being in the presence of the elderly Pham Titam. In high enough concentrations, mercury can indeed contaminate the surrounding air enough to poison someone. As for the Vietnamese government, why would they lie about pesticides being present at the scene? Well, in the most respectful way possible, the Vietnamese government haven't always been the most honest or transparent. It certainly wouldn't be the first time a government minister had covered up a cock-up to save their own skin. What if, many years earlier, some government official had been in charge of a gold mine or was responsible for the burning of coal. Both are activities that release mercury into the environment, but no doubt that same official would be responsible for the cleanup too. But what if it was quicker and easier to quite literally bury the evidence of negligence so the team could finish whatever project they had early? That would mean a promotion for the team leader, maybe even a bonus for the rank and file gold miners. So instead, they covered it up. Granted, it's pure speculation on my part, but little else could explain why the government would lie about such a thing. Well, in January of 2020, the Vietnam Academy of Science and Technology released a paper which concluded that, quote unquote, the concentration of mercury in the coastal sediment of Tai Bin is five times that of other areas. Such pollution is possibly a result of some misuses of mercurial fungicides in that region. Therefore, it's necessary to carry out further studies to fully evaluate the risks of this contamination. For example, about its effects on the food chain. I hope the scientists who produced this paper continue to study Tai Bin's mercury pollution, and I wouldn't be in the least bit surprised to find out that their quest for answers leads them right back to a little farm in the countryside. One where six members of the same family tragically lost their lives to the same terrible, mysterious affliction. In all likelihood, Someone somewhere up in the chain of command in the Vietnamese government has the blood of the Tram family firmly on their hands. Perhaps the only real mystery is if they'll ever face justice for it. Brian Schaefer was a guy who seemingly had it all. A great family, an active social life, a girlfriend who thought the world of him, and a very promising future in medicine. Then, one day, in 2006, that promising future disappeared along with Brian himself. During a night out with a close friend, the young academic vanished from the face of the earth in a manner that's left everyone scratching their heads for the past 15 years. The investigation into his disappearance led detectives down a deep rabbit hole of unanswered questions. Trust me when I say that this is a strange one. So join me as we try to answer this one question. What happened to Brian Schaefer? Back in 2006, Brian was a 27-year-old med student in his second year of study at Ohio State University. It was there that he met his girlfriend, fellow second-year med student, Alexis Wagner. The pair fell deeply in love, and Alexis was under the impression that Brian was planning to propose to her that very year 
most likely in April during a vacation they had planned to Miami. Sadly, it was also during that year that tragedy struck the Schaefer family. In March, Brian's mother, Renee, passed away from myodysplasia. Brian and his mum were extremely close, and the loss of her hit him like a ton of bricks. Still, on the outside, he appeared to be handling things well, well according to his friends at least, and he continued to speak excitedly about his upcoming trip to Miami. There was nothing Brian enjoyed more than getting away somewhere tropical. Everyone who knew him would tell you that Brian enjoyed that laid-back lifestyle that such places embodied, and that even though he was pursuing a career in medicine of all things, his real passion was music. He often spoke about his dream of becoming a musician and living the easy life. He'd once written on his MySpace page, This whole doctor thing is really just a job, only temporary, until I get my band together and put a record out. March 31st, 2006 was a Friday. It was also the start of spring break. Now March had been a particularly hard month for young Brian. Not only had the poor guy lost his mother, but he'd been pulling all-nighters cramming for exams. Even though his trip to Florida with Alexis was only three days away, the dawn of spring break seemed like a cause for early celebration. That evening, Brian met up with his father, Randy, for a steak dinner. Despite being obviously exhausted, Brian told his old man that he had plans to meet up with a friend later that night. That friend was Clint Florence. He and Brian were former roommates, and the pair were reportedly close. Randy suggested that Brian take things easy, maybe catch an early night. Brian objected. After the month that he just had, he needed a boys' night out. At 9pm, Brian and Clint met up at the Ugly Tuna Saluna, a quintessential college bar in the Arena District of Columbus. And yes, that is how us Brits pronounce tuna. No comments down below, please. Brian's girlfriend Alexis was in Toledo, visiting her parents before their big trip to Miami. He called her at around 10 to wish her good night. They exchanged I love yous and hung up. According to her, he sounded completely normal on the phone. Little could Alexis have realized that that was the last time she would ever speak to her boyfriend. Brian and Clint went bar hopping all around town that night, visiting seven bars in total. Clint would later tell detectives that they'd taken a shot at every location before arriving in Columbus's short north. It was there that the duo became a trio as they met up with Clint's friend, Meredith Reed. The three musketeers made their way back to the Ugly Tuna Saluna for one last round. They arrived around 1.15am. 45 minutes later, when the bar was closing, Clint and Meredith realized that Brian had gone off somewhere. They both tried calling him several times, but he didn't pick up. They waited outside the bar for him, and when he didn't come out with the rest of the crowd, they assumed he had already gone home to his apartment just a couple of blocks away. But he hadn't. Brian's girlfriend and father tried calling him constantly during that weekend, but he never answered the phone. When he missed his flight to Miami on Monday, April 3rd, they reported him missing. Randy was really starting to worry at this point. The guy had just lost his wife. Had he now lost his son too? Sergeant John Hurst, a father himself, understood Randy's worries and he and his team of investigators got to work right away. Now usually in these types of cases, there's at least a clear reason why the person disappeared, or where they might have disappeared to. And that wasn't the case with Brian. The detectives weren't even sure whether he'd gone missing on his own accord, or if someone else was responsible. So they started from the most logical place, the beginning, and checked the CCTV cameras both inside and outside the Gateway Film Center, the building the Ugly Tuna Saluna was located in. Since that area wasn't the nicest part of town, there were surveillance cameras aplenty. Surprisingly, however, the footage generated more questions than answers. As expected, at 1.15am, Brian was caught on CCTV riding the escalator to the second floor with Clint and Meredith and entering the bar. Shortly after, both Brian and Clint were again recorded standing just outside the bar, flirting with two women, Brighton Zatko and Amber Ruick. Brian even reportedly kissed Brighton on the neck. At 1.57am, the cameras again showed him standing just outside the bar, again with Brighton, who put her number into Brian's phone. She headed back into the bar to use the bathroom. When she returned, Brian was gone. The footage appeared to show him turn and re-enter the bar shortly after Brighton went to use the bathroom. 
Those are his last known movements. You see, the cameras never showed Brian leaving the bar. A few minutes later at 2am when the bar closed, the cameras captured the flood of people leaving the tuna, heading down the escalators and out of the building. Investigators identified everyone who left the bar that night, and Brian was definitely not amongst them. Footage from all of the outside street cameras were also checked, but there was still no trace of the guy. Brighton and Amber were tracked down and cleared of any involvement. Dozens of officers searched night and day for Brian. All of the local hospitals and shelters were checked. The sewers were scoured. Sniffer dogs were brought in to track his scent. Posters were put up everywhere, and a hefty award was announced. Possible sightings of him in Texas, Michigan, even as far as Sweden were investigated and discounted. Doors were knocked on, questions were asked, but no one seemed to know anything. After he disappeared, Brian's apartment was burgled. This brought fresh hope to the case. Surely this burglary was connected to Brian's vanishing. It wasn't, and turned out just to be a coincidence. Brian's favorite music group was Pearl Jam, and frontman Eddie Vedder took some time off during a concert to mention the case and appeal for any leads. Nobody came forward with information. Desperate for answers, Brian's father Randy paid a psychic to help find his son, and was told that his body was somewhere in the Olentangy River. Randy thoroughly searched that river, and almost lost his own life in a whirlpool, but all found no trace of his body. Brian's girlfriend Alexis called his mobile every night, but that calls never went through. Except for one night, Alexis, several months after he disappeared, when it actually rang a few times before disconnecting. Brian's phone company later said that it couldn't be decided to do His phone was so painted in India, just 14 miles from where he went missing. Another glimpse? or evidence of something more sinister. Since Brian disappeared in 2006, his phone has never been used to make a call, and his credit card hasn't been used to make a single purchase. As bad a sign as that is, to this day, his whereabouts and well-being remain unknown. We'll start with the obvious theory. Brian had been found late. Either he said the wrong thing to the wrong guy at the Ugly Tuna Saloon, or looked at the wrong guy's girlfriend the wrong way, or went down the wrong street at the wrong time on his way home. Sure, things like that happen all the time. But none of the other customers that night noticed Brian getting into an argument with anyone, and the guy didn't exactly have any enemies to speak of. So there was somebody waiting to jump, and it was most likely a stranger. Some people believe that Brian's friend Clint was somehow responsible for his disappearance, or at least know some details about him. Because even though he told his side of the story to the authorities, to this day, he still refuses to take a lie detector test. Personally, I don't think that's suspicious. Contrary to popular belief, lie detector tests are seriously unreliable, and are just as likely to get an innocent man into trouble as they are to take him out of it. Clint's lawyer likely advised him not to take the test. A sound decision, certainly not indicative of him being guilty of Brian's possible death. That doesn't mean that someone didn't do it, of course. But the main problem with this theory are those CCTV cameras. The areas outside both the bar and the Gateway Film Centre building in general were covered, and they didn't capture Brian leaving the premises. Where would the perp have jumped? Where would they have hidden his body? So, if there's no videotape of him leaving the bar, then Brian's still inside the ugly tuna saloon, right? As crazy as it sounds, some people believe that Brian somehow died in the bar that night after all the other customers had left, likely in the bathroom. Terrified of the lawsuit, the bar owner and his staff switched off the security cameras, both inside and outside the establishment, tampered with the footage which had already been recorded, and hid Brian's body, either under the floorboards or within the walls. That would explain why he was never captured on tape leaving the bar, but it completely falls apart when you hear that investigators searched the Ugly Tuna Saluna from top to bottom and didn't find any trace of Brian inside whatsoever. What about if they switched off the cameras outside the building as well, snuck him out, and disposed of his remains elsewhere? Well, that theory is still pretty hard to believe. Not only would the owner have had to convince his underpaid staff to go along with his plan, they'd also have to somehow get their hands on the CCTV footage of all of the surrounding businesses. Though technically not impossible, that seems extremely improbable. Still, since there's still no explanation for how young Mr. Schaefer left the building, wild theories like this are bound to pop up. Speaking of wild... One of the darkest and most controversial theories is that Brian fell victim to the smiley face killers. 
aka the SFK. Between the late 1990s and early 2010s, a surprisingly large number of young, well-educated, college-aged men were found dead in bodies of water across several Midwestern states. We're talking hundreds of men. At least 45 of these were determined to be the work of either one or multiple killers, and more than 200 others are still being looked into. Almost all of these slain men were athletic, popular, and successful college students, and almost all of them were targeted on their way home after spending a night on the town. It's been theorized that all of these slaves were the work of one well-organized, nationwide group called the Smiley Face Killers, who targeted, quote-unquote, privileged men. In at least a dozen of these cases, a smiley face was found graffitied at the spots where the bodies had been dumped. It's said that the SFK communicate through the dark web to select their targets. Brian was six foot two, athletically built, highly intelligent, and from a privileged background. Exactly the type of guy that the SFK targeted. With that in mind, it's easy to see what happened the next loop slink the SFK to Brian's design. Still, it's never been conclusively proven that the SFK are a real group. Smiley faces are a very common thing for people to graffiti. Just walk through your city and count how many times you bump into one. It's possible that their presence at all these spots was just a coincidence. With no further evidence to prove that the purported SFK was somehow involved in Brian's disappearance, or that they even exist, this theory lacks weight. Regardless, it's a possibility I had to share. We know that Brian wasn't caught on camera even the bar. We're also sure that he isn't still inside there somewhere, and that the staff didn't tamper with the video footage. That must mean that he vanished in the small space between the building's exit and the outside area that the cameras covered, the so-called dead zone outside the camera's view. Well, as you can see, that dead zone was only a step one. There was nowhere for him to disappear too. No. Just outside the ugly tuna saloon was a service exit that led to a construction site. On that site, workers had dug a big hole. It would have been extremely difficult for Brian to leave via that exit without being detected, but crucially, not impossible. If he stayed close to the wall, he could have snuck past the camera's field of view. The whole theory then suggests that Brian, for whatever reason, stumbled out that exit, wandered into the construction site, and fell into the hole. He either died or was knocked out from the fall, or unable to escape, and at the end of a heavy night, simply fell asleep. The next morning, the construction workers failed to spot Brian inside the hole and covered him in cement. Perhaps Brian's been much closer to home all this time than anyone could have imagined. Sadly, this theory too has its flaws, since according to the construction workers at the site, if Brian had fell into the hole, then it would have been impossible for them to have missed him. So, unless the building team just so happened to all be opportunistic killers, we're right back where we started. Then again, people, even multiple people, can sometimes make mistakes. To me, this seems like the most plausible theory so far. Finally, with no body and no suspects to speak of, is it possible that Brian didn't meet with a grizzly bait at all, and that he actually went missing on his own accord? In my opinion, the running away and starting a new life elsewhere explanation rarely turns out to be realistic. I mean, people have been searching for Brian for the past 15 years, and despite having a lot of defining features and his case becoming quite prolific, the guy still hasn't been found. On top of that, setting up a new identity and starting your life from scratch is no easy thing to do, especially for a guy in Brian's position. He wasn't exactly a man with nothing to lose. It doesn't make much sense that Brian would randomly decide to throw away his relationships and career it wasn't Brian Like I said at the beginning of this video, as intelligent and academically gifted as Brian was, he always longed for a simple life. A rather good life. The life of a musician. Maybe he got burned out in his years of study. Maybe the prospect of becoming a doctor, all the long hours, intense workload and stress, had him dreaming of a way out. With his girlfriend expecting a ring, he had the responsibilities that come with it, the realities of his upcoming future, may not have aligned with his expectations. I think we've all been to some degree, but our lives are planned out for us way too early, and oftentimes that plan is a plan A. Sometimes that plan is somebody else's altogether, and in our heart of hearts, we want nothing to do with it. 
could it be possible that Brian was secretly having those kind of thoughts? Could it be possible that he was planning on escaping the life he was leading without telling a soul? It may have just been a fantasy that he was playing within his mind until the loss of his mother, which could have pushed him over the edge. Indeed, Renee's death likely affected Brian's mental state a lot more than people realize, and it's easy to see how that could have been the emotional catalyst that finally made him decide to shed his identity altogether and change the path he was walking down in life. His once crazy fantasy may have not seemed so crazy anymore. As compelling as that all sounds, this theory still fails to answer that one necking question. How did Brian manage to get out of the building without being caught on CCTV? Some people have pointed out that he could have somehow disguised himself and kept his head down, but neither his friend Clint nor anyone that he met that night said that he was carrying a spare change of clothes. That's definitely the sort of thing you'd notice and comment on. One of the detectives on the case also told the Columbus Monthly that they were 100% certain Brian hadn't left through the main entrance in disguise. Given that Brian had been putting in heaps of effort up until that point, cramming for his exams, his decision to leave and never come back was likely made in the spur of the moment. Without thorough planning, it's hard to see how he could have left undetected. Wouldn't he have just, you know, left by the front door with everyone else and walked off into the night? And I do mean walk, since if he did decide to leave, he didn't take his car with him. It was found still parked outside his apartment. Would he have really left something so useful and expensive behind? Personally, I don't think I'd buy this one. In fact, I don't really buy any of these theories. That's what makes this case so bizarre. Nothing really seems to add up. So, where does this all leave us? Unfortunately, in a place without any answers. Even if... Hey guys, welcome to the Liberal Hive Mind, a channel solely focused on exposing the abundant hypocrisy of the left. So yup, exactly like I've been saying, this is the Democrat MO, the Democrat modus operandi. They only say and do the right thing, or at least pretend to say and do the right thing, when it's desperately needed. When their political careers are in jeopardy, when power is at stake, that's the only time Democrats do anything. We saw two attempted assassinations on former President Donald Trump, and of course the leftist reaction was, we condemn violence, we're appalled, you know, the typical stuff that you'd expect politicians to say, although I'd argue a little bit disingenuous. It feels really like Democrats just say it because they feel like they have to. And really, that's the focus, you know? It's not genuine. They do it because they need to. They do it because they have no other choice politically. But then the moment they feel as though the pressure is off, it's right back to business as usual. I mean, I'm in complete shock. I can't believe it. I mean, I can believe it because we're talking about Democrats here. But from a perspective of humanity, basic civility, and basic ethics, morality. I'm in shock and I can't understand it. I can't wrap my head around it. We're back to business as usual. Let me show you guys exactly what I mean by that. We've got some stuff to get into. So let's roll the tape. All right, folks, you won't believe who's back. After going MIA for the last two months, President Joe Biden makes a real public appearance. Kind of crazy that the President of the United States just seems to disappear for two months at a time. He's supposed to be the commander in chief of the most powerful nation, the world leader. But anyways, I guess Biden is back. Then he just wouldn't go. He was like a, a, a bug. He just kept being there. He was like a, like a bug right there. So you felt... <laughs> and immediately, he's inciting violence again. It's just crazy. The President of the United States pretends to swat Donald Trump like a bug. And you know, I know leftists are going to say, well, it's a metaphor. It's not an actual call to violence. Which, within a vacuum, I agree with you, but within the current context of, let's call it, world history, American history, yeah, no, you don't get a pass for that kind of thing. Or at least you shouldn't. Especially if you're the guy who recently said that, quote, we should put Donald Trump in the bullseye. What was that, a couple days, a week before the first assassination attempt? Which, by the way, was a statement that Joe Biden expressed regret for. Or... I just the crosshairs. That's what I'm focused on. Look, the truth of the matter was, what I guess I was talking about, at the time was, there was very little focus on Trump's uh, agenda. Yeah, the term is bullseye. 
was a, it was a mistake to use the word. I didn't, I didn't say crosshairs. I meant bullseye. I meant focus on him. Focus on what he's doing. But again, it's the same thing with these Democrats. Joe Biden only expressed regret for that statement, I think roughly a week after the attempted assassination, only once it became a news story that the Democrat Party could not ignore. And obviously, the whole narrative surrounding at the time, Democrats were clearly in a desperate state. Joe Biden was on track to lose Virginia, for Pete's sakes. So Joe Biden had to apologize. He had to say, you know, I shouldn't have said those words. And he acts as if it's legitimate regret, as if he actually cares, but obviously he doesn't. If he was even the least bit genuine, he wouldn't have done what he just did on The View. And his Commerce Secretary, Gina Raimondo, probably wouldn't be saying this on MSNBC. He says is the opposite. It's just another lie. Like, how did we get here? Let's extinguish him for good. We have an answer. We have a remarkably talented candidate who is sincere, who's pragmatic, who's open. Let's just get it done. And you see the point of the video, right? What's it been, a week since the last attempt? It was an unsuccessful attempt. It wasn't nearly as crazy as the first one. And so I guess Democrats expect it to have a shorter afterlife. And they're already back to business as usual. And obviously, when I say business as usual, I should probably add a little bit more context. It's just uh, unquestionable at this point that that man cannot see public office again. He is not only unfit, he is destructive to our democracy, uh, and he has to be uh, he has to be eliminated. Yep, pretty much back to business as usual. It's just unbelievably irresponsible. It's wrong. It's frankly evil. The way they speak of this great former president and possible next president of the United States is shameful, despicable. Most importantly, it is evil. It is wrong. To know the current threat on Donald Trump's life and to engage in this kind of rhetoric, you're a bad person. You're a person who wants to see harm done. You're a person, frankly, who probably wants to see the world burn. It's unbelievable. You know, everybody knows it at this point. Maybe not the blue in on people, the people who haven't been captured by anti-Trump hysteria. They they see it. They see the hysteria. They see the by any means necessary approach and attitude. They see this sort of callous and nonchalant approach to speaking violently in the direction of former President Donald Trump. And obviously, I think most people are smart enough to make the correlation. I just hope more people have exposure to this stuff, because when you see the Democrat rhetoric, when you see the way these people speak, it's obvious what's happening. You know, I think David Sachs made a great argument the other day. Let's just piggyback off that clip. And just on the... Um on the second assassination attempt, I don't know if you even want to go there, but I mean, gosh, I'm so glad that he yeah, didn't scary. get shot at again. This is scary stuff, folks. Uh, this rhetoric's got to come down. I keep saying that nobody wants to listen to me, but man, be... Well, let's look at the rhetoric that Ryan Ruth was literally quoting on his Twitter, was saying that Trump is basically an existential threat to democracy. He was quoting what Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and the mainstream media have been saying chapter and verse. Uh, so I think that, you know, if you want to ascribe motivation there, where did Ruth get these ideas? They've been endlessly amplified by the mainstream media, and it's not like a one-off comment. It's been the central narrative for the last several years is that somehow Trump represents this existential threat to democracy, and one way or another, that threat must be eliminated. And I think Ryan Ruth simply took literally what the mainstream media has been saying. These would-be Trump assassins are quoting Biden and Harris and all the media rhetoric, chapter and verse. And that right there is a fact. Son of alleged would-be assassin Ryan Wesley Ruth says his dad hates Trump like, quote, all reasonable people do. Oh, and just the irony here, Ryan Ruth's son claims that his dad hates Trump like all reasonable people would. But let's just say these two aren't exactly reasonable people. Or in Ruth. Son of Ryan Ruth just appeared in federal court within the last hour and a half on charges of possessing use images. He was arrested this week after investigators found hundreds of files of material in his possession while searching his Greensboro home. Right here, according to court documents, the FBI searched Ruth's apartment last weekend and uncovered multiple electronic devices. Investigators say these devices contain hundreds of files of pornography. It took agents one day to obtain a warrant to search those devices. Greensboro police initially arrested Ruth on drug charges on Saturday. They say he's accused of possessing cocaine, MDMA, ketamine, and various drug paraphernalia. Nothing to see here, I guess. Crazed lunatic, would-be presidential assassin, and his P-E-D-O son. Yeah, just regular reasonable people. What a freaking farce.
they're obvious Trump haters who have been captured by the left-wing brainwash. We also have a supposed letter written by Ryan Ruth, the would-be assassin, that Joe Biden's DOJ so irresponsibly released to the public, essentially putting a $150,000 bounty on the former president's head. I'm gonna crop that part just because I don't want to give it any more exposure, but if we start below, and this is a letter allegedly handwritten by Ryan Ruth, just listen to the way that it reads. Everyone across the globe, from the youngest to the oldest, know that Trump is unfit to be anything, much less a U.S. president. U.S. presidents must, at bare minimum, embody the moral fabric that is America and be kind, be caring, be selfless, and always stand for humanity. Trump fails to understand any of it. You know what it sounds like? It sounds like a Rachel Maddow monologue. I mean, it's nearly indistinguishable, as David Sachs said, chapter and verse. The left is obviously inspiring lone wolf actors, and frankly, they should exposed after the last couple of months. Big time, Democrats are facing a whole lot of pressure when it comes to their extreme, vile, unhinged rhetoric. And you know, at this point, you would think that what's needed is a moment of reflection, introspection, thinking, but most importantly, toning down the rhetoric, but they're doing anything but. They're continuing the rhetoric, as if nothing changed. Just like with the Jenk Uger clip that I showed you guys the other day. I'm not going to let up on Donald Trump for one second, rhetorically, because he is a monster, and he tried to terminate our Constitution, he tried to steal an election. I've never seen anyone so despicable in American politics. He's a, such a slimy con man. I loathe him. Everyone should vote against him. He's one of the worst people I have ever seen in politics. Maybe, You're guilty. Maybe, You're guilty. Maybe. Because you support Donald Trump. Maybe and Donald Trump plus. has done 2,000 times worse maybe. than you know it. And now their actions or their inaction, their inability to reform and just act like normal, rational human beings, well, it's continuing to have an effect. Idaho man charged after threatening to end Trump in multiple calls to Mar-a-Lago two weeks after Matthew Crook's assassination attempt. I don't want to show you guys the clip because, of course, it's unhinged, it's crazy, it's violent, but essentially, just like every other, it reads basically like a Rachel Maddow monologue. Another potential lone wolf actor motivated by left-wing rhetoric. It's obvious Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, the left at large, has not learned anything. They don't want to learn anything. They don't want to change. And so it's right back to business as usual. Incitement to violence against the former president of the United States. This kind of thing should be disqualifying. Anyways, that's pretty much what I got for you guys. Hopefully you enjoyed the video. If you did, make sure to leave a like and possibly subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next one. All right, guys, so if there has been one constant over the past year, it has been comments upon comments asking me to play more video games. And I don't know why, because it's not really relevant to news or culture or whatever, and we've kind of stopped doing those videos. However, you guys really love seeing me be bad at things. So today, because I'm currently on vacation and I was recording some extra content for you guys, I'm going to be trying the Microsoft Flight Simulator that went viral in 2020. I apparently totally missed this. I apparently had my head in the sand and was too busy watching Tiger King, but you guys were having fun with this flight simulator. And based on my history with VR, I'm expecting that I'll be terrible at it. So here's some good content for you guys. Let's get it started. I've now magically transported to a new part of the comment section studio, which you guys probably have not seen. You've probably seen this lovely little corner, maybe a little bit of white, maybe a little hint of wallpaper. You're over here on my couch, which I'm finally getting to use. I'm so excited. I did just sort of get a walkthrough and I got oriented, but I'm going to be taking flight for the very first time. We're in LA, right? Yes, yeah, we're in LAX. Excellent. My favorite airport. I'm gonna go point. All right, so first you gotta take off the parking brake. Yep. There oh, go. there we go. And then I'm gonna come over here. Throttle. There we go. Oh, okay. And then do I just go up to take off? Yeah, but you have to get a good uh, cruising, a, a good speed though. Right now you're going too slow to take off. See, I'm so bad at directions in these games. It's like Mario Kart. And then even in the simulation I did with Adam Carolla, I can't go straight. Oh, I'm in the air. All right, there you go. You're, 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 you're fast enough now. There you go. Oh, oh, it's backwards. So when I, I have to pull up to go. This is so nice. Should I go to Malibu? Yeah, if you can get there. <laughs> oh, Reagan, don't doubt me. I don't know if anybody else did this. When I was a kid, I was obsessed with the safety brochure in planes, and I would like dream of the day. I'm going to like curse myself saying this, but I always wanted to go down the slide. The slide in an emergency landing? Yes. <laughs> So like into the water, I was like, wow, they must have so much fun. When it gets to a certain height, would she like be warned that she can't go any higher or can it go? This plane can go up to 15,000 feet. So uh, it's rated, I think, at 20,000 feet. Anything higher than that's gonna start stalling, basically. What about how low can it go? You can go as low as you want. 
You can go as low as, as as safe as. <laughs> just try not to go too fast towards the ground because the plane will fall apart if you go faster than 120 knots. So. Caesar, you know everything. Whoa. $50 million homes. Are you going to land on the street? Is that what you're trying to do? No. It's like GTA, Brett's edition. <laughs> Try doing a barrel roll. Is that where I turn upside down? It's like when you just uh, use the left controller and just shoot left, and then you'll like spin basically in the air. There you go. Like that. Ah! Uh -oh. Keep going. Okay, I'm gonna go keep, going keep going. Keep going. Oh. Uh -oh. There you go. You died. <laughs> I have a place I want to go. Where would you like to go? I want to go to the island where I was born. Oh. Okay, we can set that. Those people do. They all have water planes or whatever they're called. Oh yeah, yeah. We can get you a pontoon plane. You can land on the water. Yes. Oh my god, I'm gonna be like one of the rich people on Orcas. Oh my god, this is so fancy. Oh, it's a between. Well, hello. Okay. All right. So this plane's super easy to fly. They use the same control, the left controller to control the yoke, which is in the center of the plane here. And then on the bottom right hand corner where, you know, the shifter would go in a normally in a car, that's the actual throttle right there. But there's also a parking brake, which I forget exactly where it's at, but it's super easy to find. Uh, so it might be somewhere on the dash. Master, brightness, flaps, lever, landing gear, strobe, navigation lights, taxi lights, landing lights. Parking brake. Oh, you found it? There it is, look at that. That is the most inconspicuous parking brake. Oh, no. I, okay, and then hit it. And hit the trigger. Oh, it didn't go. He's got to hit the trigger with it. There you go. Oh, okay. Oh, oh yeah, this, thing is, this thing takes off pretty quick. Oh, I'm going to die so fast. Ah! Oh, oh my God, I'm in the air so fast. This is so cool. Do you recognize anything? That's Moran State Park. Nice turn. Everybody see that? Did a circle, only feeling a bit seasick, air sick. This is where my house was basically. And then you could see it from the water. So when the ferries would come in, you could see that we were on this side of the island. Oh, dizzy. Uh. Oh, ah! you're stalling. Do you want to try landing in the water? Yeah. I have the throttle here and he's going to slow down. And slow down. Go down like 25%. There you go. There you go. Okay. Oh, oh. Keep going, keep going. Ah, <laughs> oh no, I didn't. No, you I just hit the water. Uh oh. It's you, you know what you gotta waters. do is you, once you get close to the water, you wanna reduce the speed all the way down to zero. So you might have to oh. throttle down all the way. Go ahead and throttle down all the way. There you go. Now you're just gliding. I did it. Is she on the water? No, not yet. She's trying. Oh. To, you keep pulling up. Go ahead. There you go. Look at that. <gasps> wow. Whoa. Is this the Top Gun one? Yeah, we're gonna do the uh, the F-18, yeah. The old Tom Cruise's spirit. All right. Wow. Now look, now look down. Okay. So use the left uh, thumbstick as usual, as like okay. you're flying the other plane. Um, but this does have afterburners that you have to use to take off. So what you want to do right now, though, is you want to disable the parking brake, which is on your left, and that you can see that yellow knob, and just hit it with the trigger. There you go. Now with your left hand, you're going to use the trigger on the left hand to move the the pow the uh, throttles, which are right here, right here. You're going to move those all the way forward, all the way, oh. all, all, the way all the way forward. No, that's not all the way forward. Then you got the activate. It's not. It's not loading. It's not loading. All right, let's see. Go ahead. I think I am forward. You know, I'll do it. It's kind of. Oh, you're right. There, there we you go. go. You might have to do the other one because there's two throttles. You got two engines. You have to. Where? Load. Oh. Yeah, right next to it. And just grab it. Yeah, there you go. Once it turns. I, ooh, no! Damn it! Come on! Register! Ah! It's not. Oh, hit, the, hit, hit, the, tr hit the trigger. There you go. And that's not lighting up. Oh, and then I don't get it. Oh, well, you're flying actually. You're, you're oh, pull oh. up, pull up. <laughs> well, what about the other one? Or you're on full afterburner on one engine, I, I guess. <laughs> okay, that was stressful. She can go higher in this one than the other one, right? Oh yeah, for sure. You can go, uh, if you had full afterburner, you can go up to 30,000 feet. I struggled to like 
go straight on these things. Like if I pull up, I'm always pulling to like the side. Okay, I'm literally just trying to fly in a straight line and I am so dizzy. I don't know how people do this. This is so rough. Unlike rough greens, which is not rough at all. It's actually excellent for your dog's health and you should be giving it to them. Rough greens is a supplement that contains all the necessary vitamins, minerals, probiotics, and antioxidants that your dog needs every single day. And things that he's probably not getting from his conventional kibble. What I love about rough greens is that because it is a supplement, you don't have to go out and buy some fancy new expensive dog food. You don't have to do all the research and break the bank. You can just sprinkle this powder on your dog's food every single day and you will be taking a huge step for his health. And guys, you might have seen this already in some of my other videos, but just to remind you, Naturopathic Dr. Dennis Block, who is the founder of Rough Greens, has some huge news for all the cat lovers out there. He has just introduced Meow Greens. So if you feel guilty when your dog eats Rough Greens and your cat has not gotten to try it, now they can. You can go to roughgreens.com slash Brett to get a free Jumpstart trial bag of either the Rough Greens or the Meow Greens. Again, that is roughgreens.com slash Brett, or you can call 877-66-MY-DOG today. And that's to try a free trial bag of either Meow Greens or Rough Greens, which can be at your door in just a few business days. All all right, now that I've had a break, thanks Rough Greens, let's jump back in and maybe I'll be a little less plane sick, air sick? What do you even call this? What's really cool about this plane is if you look in the center, you see that little uh, cool heads up display. Oh yeah, it's telling me where I'm going. Yeah, to the left is the speed and then to the right is your altitude. Wow. Oh, the center is like if you're actually wanting to shoot a plane yeah. down, but the- Spin! Whee! There you go, look at that. Didn't die this time. The, that's helpful, but it's also stressing me out. I can't just go up. Every time I pull up, I'm turning. Use, use the heads-up display to reorientate or orient yourself. Oh. There you go. I can't get back to land. <laughs> Every time I try to turn, I just go upside down. You're going straight Try's down right now. Oh. You're going towards the water. It's because the water's uh, tricking you. You want to go towards land. Where? Pull up, pull up. How? <laughs> Every time I do it, I turn. I can't. There we go. There we go. Is that better? There you go. Okay. There you go. I'm getting stressed. Where's home? You pour out and see it is funny. I know. I know that it's there. I can't get myself to turn. So you have to turn and then pull up. That's the thing with these points. Is you turn and then you pull up on the yoke so you can actually like go in that direction. Let me go home. I'm lost at sea. I think you're about to water. Oh, I'm low. Okay, oh, I'm fuel as well. <laughs> that was so hard, the fact that you can't just turn like a car. Wait, you're going to watch a feature. Yeah. Let's do it. I'll finally visit. We're going to actually start on the air, so we can actually just enjoy the view. Oh, nice. All right, look forward. Okay. Reset your view. Okay, and then shut now. So now, uh, be really careful with this plane, but it should be to your right. You should be able to see it somewhere. Oh, is that over there? Oh yeah, it's right here on the right. Look, look to your right, there's uh, that little <gasps> thing. Wow, that's awesome. Oh, that's so cool. Whoa, this is so beautiful. I didn't know this is what it all looks like. I'm impressed how well you're doing. Is up there on the right? Is that it's the like straight ahead. Letter? Yeah, yeah that letter, yeah. Oh. You're crushing it, by the way, because oh. this is... I'm turning. Good this shot is much easier it. than the military... 500. Whoa. I'm honestly shocked that you're flying like this. Oh. Stop. Stop. It wouldn't let me go up anymore. Yeah, he stalled. It's really hard flying around mountains, which I was actually shocked today. That was awesome. Yeah. That was a lot. I'm genuinely very tired. I feel like I should have some like pumped up end of episode, like this is so wild. And it was wild, that's the thing. But I feel like I felt like a real pilot because now I'm so tired. Have you seen those videos where pilots are like drenched, but maybe I'm only thinking of like Top Gun, but because the pressure is so insane, that's how I felt. And I had nobody in the plane with me and it wasn't real. So all that to say, this is very realistic, but I think my favorite part was going back to San Juan because I know that area so well to be able to fly around that was so cool. And then Machu Picchu was insane. I want to go there even more. 
but I can hold off for a little longer. I think the best time of year is apparently to go in October, and I don't have time since October. So next October, Reagan and I will be going to Machu Picchu. But until then, I'll be in my VR. All right, guys, see you later. Thanks for watching. Well, guys, if you like this episode, make sure you like this video, subscribe to this channel if you have not already, and if you want even more content, you can follow me on Instagram, Snapchat, and TikTok. See you guys next time. Greetings and salutations, loyal viewers of this channel. My name is Sean, and today we got to talk about this TikToker who decided that he was going to attempt and fail miserably to debunk Charlie Kirk on crime and say that black people don't commit more crime than any other group in the United States of America and try to fool you into believing that it is in fact evil white and racist to talk about criminality and that whites are the most criminal. All of these things are contained within this video and I'm going to debunk, refute, dispute, and absolutely destroy it because it's ridiculous and absurd. But before we get into that, I want to thank everybody who supports this channel via Act actualjusticewarrior.com slash join. Oh, give me the money. Give you, give me the money, okay? Black Americans are about 13 to 14 percent of the population, yes. but half of all prisoners are black. Exactly. So blacks commit more crimes than whites do. They commit more murders, they commit more arsons, they commit more kidnappings. For example, blacks are 13 percent of the population and they commit 58 percent of all the murders. Okay. Let's talk about it. So Charlie Kirk drops down a bunch of different various numbers on black criminality in the United States of America in this clip that this guy decided to play. And by the way, it's absolutely crucial that you understand it, that where he chose to play this clip is deceptive in and of itself, just like the rest of this video, because the one stat that Charlie Kirk got incorrect actually came from the crowd around him Googling it and instead finding the historic black prison population, which actually was at certain points in our history over 50% of the prisoners. Wait, let's pause on that. So you believe that a lot of people who have gone to jail shouldn't be in jail? A small percent. What percent would you say? 5%. You would say only 5%. When you have a system of justice, you're going to have a small percent. I have a question. Can I get a Google? What percentage of people currently incarcerated are black. Well, it's, hold on. It's what? Hold on. No, I know, but the, the fact, the fact I'm saying, the fact I'm saying 5%. Oh, hold on so that's the point that I'm trying to make, exactly. Well, who might have been, might have been here, might have been here. Yeah, so it, Okay, so I want to make a quick you're point. You're right, black Americans are in prison far greater than the percentage of the population. So the black Americans are about 13, 14% of the population, yes, but exactly. half of all prisoners are black. Exactly. So blacks commit more crimes than whites do. So this guy says, we're gonna talk about it. Let's talk about it. Let's discuss this. But I just wanna point out that he is not at all, at any point in this video, going to address the fact that black people are in and around 13% of the population and they committed 58% of the homicides. Now, to be fair, the most accurate version of this stat is as follows, that black people are in and around 13% of the population, yet in any given year, they will commit between 46 and 62% of the homicides in the United States of America. It varies depending on the year. But this guy is going to go full denial mode and try to convince you that evil white racists are promulgating these numbers even though white people commit the most crimes, but his own numbers will betray him. Trust me. These are obviously racist claims, but I will respond to them as if Charlie Kirk were a reasonable person. So he says that these are obviously racist stereotypes, racist stalking points, racist, 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 as a mechanism to poison the well. But the fact of the matter is talking about black criminality in a factual way is not racist. You might be uncomfortable with those numbers because you cannot face reality yourself because of your own personal weakness. But the facts are what they are. Black people commit way more crime and this idiot is going to inadvertently show that to us throughout the course of this video. Black Americans are about 13 to 14 percent of the population, yes, but half of all prisoners are black. Wrong. Just 38 percent of America's prison population is black. That's according to the U.S. government. So this guy says, wrong. Just 38 percent of America's prison population is black, and that's according to the U.S. government. Well, no, you're wrong on this already, because this is according to the Federal Bureau of Prisons, and it's actually referring to the federal prisoners. So this is not the overall prison population of the United States of America. Just look at that center column right there where it says number of inmates and maybe, just maybe, if you had any kind of intelligence, any kind of curiosity, that would be a tip off that we're not talking about the total population, which is well over a million of prisoners in the United States of America and maybe a specific section of the population instead. I mean, again, do you think these numbers are the total population for the country? Asians, 2,347, Blacks, 60,679, 
Native Americans, 4,443. White, 88,696. So there's a bunch that I gotta point out about this specific chart, other than the fact that it is federal inmates and not state and federal inmates combined. So one of the things that should be obvious is that this guy rounded down 38.9% for the black federal population. Just 38% of America's prison population. 38%, but he also rounded up 56.8% to 57% for the white. Makes you wonder why Charlie feels the need to be make them 57% of the federal prisoners, while black people who are between 12 and 13% of the population are 39% of the federal prisoners. So in every way, shape, or form, this guy is wrong about the numbers that he presented. And when you look at the actual prison population, what you discover is that blacks are the plurality of prisoners in America's criminal justice system. Now this comes from you, and its source is the Bureau of Justice it's comparing it to the census bureau and it has whites at 60 percent of the population circa 2017 30 percent of the prisoners hispanics 16 percent of the population 23 percent of the prisoners and blacks who are at 12 percent of the population are 33 percent of the prisoners so they are the plurality the numbers in 2017 are actually lower for the blacks in terms of the overall population compared to just the federal population but obviously they are committing the most crimes the most most, not the least, not less than white people, not even close, the most, especially when you factor in per capita. And by the way, this is after 10 years of the racial gap between whites and blacks shrinking in the United States of America, there's still more in terms of raw numbers. So this idiot put the wrong source with the wrong prison population, didn't account for Hispanics, it didn't realize that even if you pretended Hispanics didn't exist, the numbers still show wildly higher incarceration rates for black Americans. And of course, he did it while calling Charlie Kirk racist and criticizing his rounding when all of his results and his intentional rounding up for whites and rounding down for blacks was done deceptively. Nice job, you absolute buffoon. Exactly. So blacks commit more crimes than whites do. Wrong. The word so is doing a lot of heavy lifting in that sentence. Exactly. So blacks commit more crimes than saying so as in therefore, as in Prison population. Charlie is smart enough to know that correlation does not equal causation, but he's hoping that you don't know that. So he deploys the word so to make you think he's coming to an obvious conclusion. Exactly. So black instead, he's making an illogical racist leap. So this guy's like, whoa, Charlie Kirk is lying. But even if he wasn't lying, which by the way, he wasn't, I just proved it, just because more black people are in prison, which is where you know people are convicted of more crimes, that doesn't necessarily mean that they're committing more crimes, which is ridiculous, stupid, insane in every possible way, but this guy actually throws it out there and he makes it sound a little smart to say, correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. Well, the thing is, when you 
commit crimes and then you get busted for those crimes, the causation was you committing the crime, and that ends up leading to the effect of you being in prison. And when one group does it more, they're in prison more. Charlie knows that we don't have usable data about who commits crimes. It's impossible to have that data since so many crimes go both unreported and or unsolved. So this guy's an absolute idiot from top to bottom, but he speaks with a intelligent sounding cadence. So a lot of people buy into the idea that we just don't have the data because crime goes unreported and we just don't have enough information to actually determine who is committing the crime. And then he of course deploys a level zero level argument related to how crime statistics are gathered. And it's pretty embarrassing. It's in fact something that I would expect to hear maybe five years ago and dispute on this channel, but it's being thrown out and it's going viral despite the fact that it makes no sense at all. Charlie knows that we only have data about arrests and convictions. I'll come back to that data in a moment. So this guy says we only have data on arrests and convictions, and he pulls up really quickly the Uniform Crime Report from 2019, and then he pulls up something else really quickly, which I'm assuming is related to convictions, and says we'll talk about this later. But I've decided that we should talk about this now, because one of the number one fallacies, one one of the number one ways you know somebody has no clue what they're talking about is if they believe that crime is measured in arrest. The Uniform Crime Report does have numbers on arrest, but let's be clear about this. Crime is measured in reports. Crime is measured not in arrest, but in reports. If they find a body, somebody is dead, and they don't arrest the suspect, and they know it's a murder, it gets reported in the crime statistics as a homicide. And if you don't believe me, don't worry about it, because I'm going to link all of my sources in the description of this video, as well as my sources so you can check his information and realize how wrong he is. And I'm using the 2019 They have offenses known, and then a percentage of offenses that are cleared by arrest, and then it goes by the category. Now that says 55.5% are cleared by an arrest, so obviously that means that 54.5% of these crimes that are reported are not arrest data. They are reporting data. Again, this is a basic thing in crime statistics. This is something that you learn at level 0.1. This guy's still on level zero, and it's embarrassing. Charlie knows that we only have data about arrests and convictions. I'll come back to that data in a moment. But on top of that, if a crime goes unreported, we still have a way of measuring it. Again, since 1972, we've conducted something called the National Crime Victimization Survey. And for the four major categories, but obviously not homicide, because the victims of homicide aren't great at filling out surveys, we ask people if they've been victimized. We ask them if they know the person that victimized them. We ask them for gender. We ask them for race and they provide us numbers each and every year. This absolute idiot is pretending that that's not one of the most comprehensive surveys on crime victimization in the world. Also, local police departments do this as well. And by the way, the reason we do this is because unlike this absolute doofus who just figured out or thought in his brain, whoa, but if they don't make an arrest, how do they measure the numbers? People figure this out decades ago. And in fact, not only do we have this data, but we can use the data from the victimization surveys, those people who can identify the race of the perpetrator of the crime that they report was committed against them, and compare and contrast that to the Uniform Crime Report data on arrests. And one of the things that we discovered in 2021, when the Bureau of Justice Statistics did a study on this, is that according to the National Crime Victimization Survey, 33% of the perpetrators of these crimes that aren't murder, because obviously victims of homicide can't fill out surveys were black and the arrest data showed us that 34.9 percent of those who were arrested were black and remember what i said about the incarceration data that showed us about a third of the prison population 33 percent are black so what we find out is whether you're doing reporting arrests or victimization surveys that are completely separate from law enforcement blacks commit absent murder 
33% of the crimes in the United States of America, despite being 13% of the population. Again, all of my sources and his sources will be linked in the description of this video. Charlie knows that we only have data about arrests and convictions. I'll come back to that data in a moment. What's painfully obvious is that Charlie Kirk isn't interested in understanding the statistics he so carelessly misquotes. He's interested in making bad faith arguments. The absolute irony of this guy saying it's painfully obvious that Charlie Kirk isn't interested in understanding the statistics he quotes as he quotes federal prison statistics that don't include Hispanics where they're rolled into whites so he can make bad faith arguments. And by the way, he represented that as the national prison population. What an absolute goof in every possible way. He's interested in making bad faith arguments. Something that becomes even more obvious in his next point. Blacks are 13% of the population and they commit 58% of all the murders. Wrong again. And loud this time. If Charlie were interested in honesty, he would have mentioned the other 1350 statistic. Yes, black people are about 13% of the population, but make up 53% of all criminal exonerations. In fact, black people make up 55% of all murder exonerations specifically. Black this is one of the most embarrassing misdirects I've ever seen in my entire life. This guy goes to the national database of exonerations and says, wow, the real 1350 stat is that black people are 13% of the population, but they they represent 55% of the exonerations for murder, checkmate bigot. But the thing is, I'm not an idiot. I wasn't born yesterday. I'm not this person. I understand that these numbers in no way, shape, or form at all whatsoever change the murder stats that we see from the FBI. So let's actually go to the page and show you the rest of it that this guy didn't point out so I can demonstrate what an absolute fool he is. So as you can see, this is the exact same chart that he showed. And what you can see for yourself is that there are, according to this chart, 1167 murder exonerations, wink, wink. So this article came out on October 7th, 2022. And this says that it's all the exonerations, according to this registry, that date back to the year 1989. Now, for those of you who aren't great at mathematics, what we're gonna say is that would be a 32 year time period and in this 32 year time period according to this chart there are this many exonerations that is 1167 but we're not talking about 1167 black murder exonerations we're talking about 55 percent of that so we take that number and we multiply it by 0.55 to get 55 percent and what we end up discovering is that the total number of murderers that were black, that were exonerated, according to the numbers that this guy put up, are 641.85. Now we will round that up to 642. And when we divide that by the 32 year time frame that we're given in this chart, that ends up giving us about 20 black murderers that are allegedly exonerated every year. Now, when we go to the Uniform Crime Report of 2019, which is the one that I'm using because he flashed it on screen really quickly, we find out exactly how many known black murderer suspects are present there by looking at this particular chart. And by the way, for those of you who are wondering about where Hispanics are, they are on this side of the chart in the ethnicity category because the stats are actually present here. And what we see is that when you combine the race of all the black offenders from this particular year, which by the way are in this category right here, all of them vertically, you get 3,218. And when you divide that by the 20 exonerations, if we believe that to be true, what you end up finding out is that if you are convicted of murder and you are a black person, Person, then there's only one in 160.9 chance that you are going to be exonerated in the future if we accept all of these exonerations to be legitimate, which by the way, I definitely don't. Now, another thing that is incredibly deceptive in this data that he presented, which by the way, has nothing to do with Charlie Kirk and what he presented, because obviously one in 160 cases being a quote unquote exoneration is less than 1% of the overall cases, is the idea that he tried to sneak into your mind, which is if a black person is exonerated for a homicide, then that must mean that the real killer, wink, wink, is not another black person when the exact opposite 
is more likely to be true. Again, people are typically killed by people of their same race, and if you misidentify a suspect, it's unlikely that when you identified a black person, you actually meant to identify a Chinese person. Like, we understand how this works, that if there's a drive-by shooting and they get the wrong gangbanger in the drive-by shooting, chances are the other gangbanger looked close enough to the approximate to that particular shooter. So this guy is an absolute idiot in every possible way, and this this argument right here has nothing to do with anything again if you're actually interested in understanding the statistics rather than making bad faith arguments you would actually be able to present this in an adequate way to prove your points but your points are asinine you're just trying to call people racist because you're uncomfortable by the state of black criminality in the United States of America black people are more likely than any other group in this country to be convicted of crimes they did not commit and then people like you have the nerve to parade these stats around as though they prove something the irony of that statement coming from this individual, the absolute audacity for this guy to say, you have the nerve to parade these stats around as if they prove your point when he is parading stats around that he either doesn't understand or is inserting deceptively in there in order to trick you that nowhere near prove his point. Again, he just tried to address the idea that black people commit well over half of the murders in almost every year in this country, despite being 13% of the population with some exoneration numbers that, that again even by those numbers don't represent a significant portion of those arrested and convicted for murder who are black and on top of all of that those numbers don't necessarily prove that the real killer wink wink in those cases isn't another black person the reality is that you probably know these stats but you leave them out on purpose because to bring that stat into this conversation would make some people think and that's the last thing a person like you wants again the irony the guy's like in reality you probably know these stats i mean in reality this guy pulled up and put up on screen the 2019 stats that cover murder by race he said we'll get back to them never got back to them because because probably when he looked those stats in the face, they made him uncomfortable and he decided that he'd rather hide from it. He decided that he'd rather pull up random exoneration data as if that proved anything at all. And the crazy thing about this is that this guy goes out of his way to accuse Charlie Kirk of lying and being deceptive and all of that, when the only thing that Kirk was factually incorrect about was something that he got from the crowd. When in contrast, this guy got everything wrong. He got every stat that he put forward wrong. He rounded up inappropriately, rounded down inappropriately and he presented all this look over here kind of things and he didn't even know that we don't measure crime in arrests we measure it in reports and for unreported crime we have the national crime victimization survey and those also show that black people disproportionately commit more crime than any other group of people again according to the victims in both reported and unreported crimes embarrassing in every possible way shameful in every possible way this guy's an absolute clown and he's on tiktok apparently apparently that nonsense flies really well over there but it's not based in fact and it's honestly a humiliating experience for somebody to post a video like this and have a literally everything wrong again even the basics how we measure crime is this the united states prison population or just federal prisoners absurd insane asinine this is confirmation bias to the max this is somebody who thinks because he sounds kind of smart that he's a lot smarter than he actually is going up against somebody who actually knows his information and what's worse about this is that he lost an argument to charlie kirk when it was a video you have every advantage when you're responding to somebody else's video because they can't talk back and this guy still lost the debate it's absolutely crazy honestly but you know what those are just my thoughts i want to know what you guys think down in the comments below if you like the video show by leaving a like subscribe for more content follow me on my social media support me the support links in the description of this video this has been me talking about this absolute craziness until next time here we are with our animals our furry friends once again and you know what every time we watch one of these videos i get this close to uh going out and get myself another furry friend but you know what let's leave it in the video without further ado let's get down to it if you guys like what you see please subscribe hit like and let's go enjoy the furry friends that we that live with us day three of buying a goldfish and letting them free Will they live? Will they live? Will you catch him in 
20, 30 years, 10 years, five years, I don't know, three years. <laughs> I don't know, man. I, oh yeah, you almost got eaten already. Why is this dog scaring the F out of me right now? Because <laughs> it looks like a stuffed animal. Its eyes are perfectly circular, just like a stuffed animal. Someone moved his couch. <laughs> Dude, the, the unsure dog of... Do I jump? Do I not jump? And they... You know, it... Way to be a good mom. Good dog mom there. This is his 457th sentence to air jail for escaping from the yard. <laughs> I love bugs, dude. <laughs> it's surprising that you are like, dude, how did you get out? Because after 10 minutes and they get the zooms, they can barely breathe anymore. And then they're down and out for the day. That is the best part of a pup is 10 minutes of wildness, 20 hours of it napping. When you're trying to save the fish, you're caught. I'm up here trying to save these fish because why would you capture all these fish and they still try to breathe? I'm gonna go put him back in a pond. <laughs> That's some flare on you, lie. Cool. Rare. Rare. $10,000 minimum. I didn't share my sandwich. <laughs> Don't you dare even give me that stink eye. Do you even know what I have to eat around here? I eat the freaking same piece of cardboard ball that you put in my bowl every day and all I'm asking is for one bite. <laughs> oh. <laughs> that is hilarious, dude. Oddly, very fitting too. Very on point. Reasons why you must buy a glass chair. <laughs> very nice. <laughs> yeah, it starts with a toy and then turns to real life. You can't do that. Like, I hope you don't have kids. I hope you don't have on planning having on kids because you're training your dog ain't right. <laughs> Is this a cat off for the bird? Cats, they all got a Jeffrey Dahmer sense in them. Bob, you're cooking, but you have a cat. <laughs> oh, they get everywhere, dude. What you do in this situation? Oh, ah. 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 What the hell? Gross, dude. Red Lobster or National Geographic? <laughs> well, we got to know what restaurant it is. I mean, a mouse, a rat, whatever. A crab now freely walking about. You pooped inside when the Roomba was going off. Oh. You killed me, bro. <laughs> you know, that is right there. Strike two of why not to get an animal. <laughs> Some animals are freaking mini humans. Well, don't ever say never. I mean, a cup pet turtle, we have seen it, but you know, the tortoise all with the, the humans all day. Baddest kitty at NYC. Today he stays. Tomorrow is another story. I bet he doesn't always stay. And the pizza finally arrived. <laughs> it's just so nice and warm underneath the computer. 
cats always go to the warm spot. You know, that they usually sunbathe and then at night they find a little piece of technology to cling to. Ooh, what the Canada? How does it get up there? Like, I just don't see where, where it climbs up to get up there. How are you getting down? Oh, is that a moose? No, that is a moose. A meese. It's no, I thought it was a donkey there for a second, but... Now I'm curious. I gotta know, how does it get down? Do you gotta call someone? Oh, come on now. thinking about it you know it's kind of wanting to do it but I, it knows it's not a good idea caught 4k <laughs> oh that is great a great spot for the old ring camera in the corner Hell yeah, dude. We got Joe Dirt and uh professional football player here, dude. <laughs> Poor little guy can't even keep up with you, dude. Alright, so we've got one calf python up here in the reef, here at Castaways Beach. So he was in the eve and he sort of made his way and climbed up and yeah. Found him up here, which is pretty cool. Yeah, we'll get him out to some bushland now and you just get a machete and there you go, man's best friend. Essa, deixa eu pedir aqui uma força para os moradores do bairro do Fernando. Oh, é, já sabemos da, da informação dessa égua aqui, ó, que tem um, é, um esquadro quebrado, né? Como o fala. E ela vive pelo bairro. How does that do horse even aí. walk? That's what I want to know. I mean, like, né? but for that thing to still be walking and moving, here it is, a dog in a fridge eating cake. <laughs> this is like a freaking. Billy Madison. Well, I put the dog in the fridge to eat the cake because I've never seen a dog eating a cake in the fridge and I've always wanted to see it. Never gonna see a blue duck either there. The only love I let hit me. Yeah, and here's the guy you uh, don't put your dishes away for a second after taking a drink. You're done. You're, you're freaking, your ass is grass. And this guy, can poop on the floor, freaking make a mess all around his meal dish and water dish. Ain't no problem. I came home for lunch to find my neighbor's dog drinking the rain. <laughs> he didn't leave the dang toilet seat up for me, son of a biscuit. My brother's cat might be old and blind, but he still loves to watch the birds with his brother. <laughs> oh, wow. Long fight to his nails. Get a dog that sheds? I will absolutely not do that. This is, that's gross, man. Who did? <laughs> Dude, that is priceless. Oh, that he stays there and doesn't move. Like, you just, you know, some humans are lost in the world on their way coming down to this world and slip into a dog's body. Does your dog bite? No, but he shoots rubber bands. What? <laughs> How do you even, dude? Like, I don't even know if you can train a dog to do that. That just is all natural. New eco-friendly trash can. <laughs> Best part of a dog, any animal is, dude, they pick up all the scraps. All of them, dude. Nothing to worry about. When your dog has been sleeping quietly all day, but chooses the exact moment you need to join a work Zoom call to start slowly squeaking his new toy. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god. 
Oh, my. Oh, I'm out of I'm here. I'm out of here. Freak no, out. No, I'm grabbing the croc. I'm grabbing my big freaking croc that I don't have yet. We're going to get it soon. And I'm swacking it, dude. Oh, shoot. Dude, I'd be pissed. <laughs> oh, he ain't. He's amped, dude. Check what she... Dude, look at the work I did, man. I'm playing games just like you. Or are you playing games? <laughs> Screaming like four-year-old helps. I'm not sorry to laugh. Like, you had the choice to get a dog, don't get a dog. You got a dog. Enjoy. Enjoy. I don't give a goddamn half a time or whatever. It don't matter to me because I'm about dead anyway. So, what I give a shit? <laughs> what the hell do I care? I don't. <laughs> but you left a little soul patch on his chest. Fits that dog so well. Bro is tired of pretending. No one's looking? <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. Screw the diet, dude. No one's watching me. I'm cheating all day. Dad, I don't want a dog in this house. Dad and dog. <laughs> hey, it's not our fault. When you guys, when the kids start asking, can we get an animal? We got to take care of it. The relationship, the bond happens between us, not you guys. The final boss has too much HP. <laughs> Can't plan that, dude. It's just so nice. That didn't even scrap the fur off, dude. Wow. Dude, there's something really satisfying about watching this. Never knew how they climbed, and now we do. Kind of satisfying. Right on the end of the south, once you hit it, the alligator has to grab you. You pop that as hard as you can, it fits the bomb, you open the mouth, you can hit it off. Right, lady, if you try to climb in, you try to get out of sight, you probably climb in, it's hard to get it back out. What's that feeling? Yeah, I always bring up the old, uh, the great north. But, uh, you know, we don't have gators. We don't got big spiders, poisonous snakes, poisonous spiders. Cold water is just not the worst thing. Have you ever wonder if someone was actually... <laughs> Didn't even cover the poop, dude. Really? <laughs> If it ain't your car, you shouldn't you shouldn't have posted the video. No one would have known if you didn't post the video. <laughs> that is amazing. Is that for or dog or both? Quite amazing. Dude, what people spend for their animals is insane. Some of the wild things that I know we've all seen. Mind blown. But alright, that does it. Do you see yourself in the video? Do you see your animal in the video? Because I know a lot of people watching, you got your furry friends hanging out with you right now and enjoying the vid. Always love animals. Always have, always will. But when, maybe one day we'll get animals again. But for now, it's not going to happen. And for now, that does it. But hopefully you guys enjoyed. Hope you keep coming back for more. Because you never know what's going to be next. Your own. The D Channel. No way. Bats can get that small. I never knew. That's got to be a freshie.
That's disgusting, but uh, that's got to be like a freshly born little sucker. Maybe you could train the thing. I mean, apparently they eat a lot of Skeeters. Good, but knowing they're that small, it's going to make me think twice now. Hey guys, welcome back to Clownfish TV. This is Neon. I am here with Geeky Sparkles. Hello. And we're gonna talk about Hasbro, Chris Cox, and uh, uh, the kid alts that they're chasing. They're not after your kids anymore, guys. So there's Thank some... God, no kidding. Hasbro doesn't want your children anymore. No, they want kid alts, which are basically teenagers, and they want adult collectors, and they're going all in on collectibles and mobile apps. According really? to Chris Cox, yes. Well, he looks like a cock because he's got short and curly hair. Oh, oh. So let's uh, let's talk about this. Before you get into it any further, please subscribe for more pop culture news, views, and rants. Guys, get yeah, woohoo if if you do. Woohoo. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm losing my voice here, man. It's like. Welcome in, ladies, gentlemen, non-binary folks, gender queer individuals, the he hims, the she hers, the zers, the they thems, the straight people, the gay people, the lesbos, the asexuals, the demisexuals, the bisexuals, wherever you are out there in the world. All of you are welcome on our channel today as we're going to be reacting to woke gender TikToks. Yes, we're entering the LGBTQIA plus realm today. So without further ado, let's get into it. Yeah, you better. All right, guys, before we get into today's video, please like and subscribe. As I said out the gate, we're going to be reacting to woke gender slash LGBTQ TikToks, which is a fun series of mine that I got to keep up with on this channel. So we're going to start with who are the LGBTQ plus people voting for? In this scenario, a trans person who's apparently voting for Kamala Harris. Shocker. Let's see why. Why would I not vote for Kamala? I am a queer person who was assigned female at birth living in America. My options are literally... <laughs> If I vote for one person, in life and safety if I vote for Kamala. Like, please. Life and safety if you vote for Kamala Harris. If you vote for Donald Trump, you're going to die. Be so for real right now. Of course I would vote Kamala. It makes sense that my community of people are supporting and voting for Kamala. The only group who would not suffer under Trump's reign are literally cis white men. That's it. One group of people. I gotta pause. I mean, didn't we already have a Trump presidency? A four year term from President Donald Trump? And how many people in the LGBTQ community died because of it? Please give me the numbers and the stats on that. This individual is probably older than what? Seven and a half years old now, which means they lived through the Trump presidency and managed to make it to the other end without ing. So how are we here exactly? Anyways, let's continue watching. People and America is made up of a lot of different groups of people, not just cis white men. So it makes a lot of sense why people are backing Kamala. But even a good chunk of cis white men that I've seen aren't even supporting Trump. That man is a compulsive liar. He'll post one thing on social media and then go and say something else at a rally. But he's is Trump the one who's guilty of that? We've been fact-checking Kamala since day one. We all watched her whole performance at the presidential debate where she said a whole bunch of lies about fracking, about racial unity, about wanting to take people's guns, about all of her different stances on these issues that she's flip-flopped on depending on the audience she's speaking to. And we fact-checked that right here. You guys can check out the video. So I don't know that Donald Trump is really the liar of the two. If anything, he might be a little too honest, which people aren't comfortable with. Staying in what he's doing doesn't match up. It never does. A man was using AI imagery to try to swing some of the voters to come and vote for him. Like, that is just so sad. That is so sad. But scary at the same time, because AI has gotten so good that a lot of older generations of people can't tell the difference between generative AI and real life. A lot of us younger folk and people who are constantly on the internet can. But not everyone can, and that's terrifying. And honestly, shouldn't even be allowed for candidates to use while they're running for president of the United States. Uh, <laughs> and it's quite literally someone who lies 
versus someone who has proven through their actions that they do mean good in this world. Kamala might not be perfect, no human is. But the most important thing is that she listens. And we the people have power too, to change things, to make a difference, to make our voices heard, and to make people listen to us. Trump doesn't care about us non-billionaires. Kamala has shown that she's for the people and I support that. Okay. I mean, not a single shred of evidence throughout that entire video, and I'd be curious what actions uh, Kamala Harris is doing to make you believe she cares about you more than the other candidate, but we all know that this is how it's going to go, especially for the LGBTQ woke crowd, because there is an LGBTQ crowd that is not woke, but for the woke crowd of the LGBTQ group, of course, they're going to be voting for Kamala and saying that it is a life and death situation, even though we have absolutely no evidence to substantiate that claim. And I I've even seen people on Twitter saying that if you're an LGBTQ plus person and you're voting for Donald Trump, you are essentially committing suicide and killing yourself, which is just such a crazy thing to say. And we should really question and view with a healthy amount of skepticism the people who are making these really dangerous claims about a Trump presidency, especially when we consider the fact that we've already lived through one. Anyways, let's continue on to the next. This one is also a transgender individual talking about gender dysphoria and ongoing gender dysphoria. I need to know, oh my God, if it's normal for me to literally have have done every single surgery and I still have so much dysphoria to the point where right now I was supposed to go to dinner and there's no way in fucking hell that I'm gonna go because I feel like is there anyone like that like I am going insane all right yeah, I mean, this is a really interesting video. I do feel sorry for this person who is clearly going through it and probably has been going through it for quite some time. You can see they've gone through many procedures. It looks like facial feminization as well as other plastic surgery and cosmetic procedures on the face to appear more feminine. It seems like they've gone through many surgeries with the body as well to appear more feminine. And I wouldn't be surprised if they've done the whole list of, of sex reassignment procedures that one can do. Plus it seems vocal training or maybe a procedure for uh, vocal feminization as well. And you know, to be honest, before hearing the voice, it looks straight up like a, a woman to me in more ways than one, maybe an exaggerated version of, of a woman, but still looks that way nonetheless. And to see that the gender dysphoria is following in them through all these procedures really points out, I think, a little deeper fact about those who experience gender dysphoria and the transgender crowd, and this may not be the case for all, but it is the case for many, that going down this route of sexual reassignment surgery doesn't necessarily fix the problem that you are dealing with, the underlying issue. And that's why I really have to call out the medical practitioners, the scientists and researchers who are pushing forward the narrative that the only real response to gender dysphoria when it is viewed in patients is to push them down the route of blind medical affirmation because a lot of times you'll find out that these patients go through every single procedure known to man when it comes to switching and changing your gender and on the other end of it they are still not okay with themselves they still feel an incongruence they still feel as though they can't accept themselves so much so that this individual doesn't even want to go out to dinner presumably dinner with like friends or family and peers and people who want to be around her and she won't go so if we don't address the actual issues that are bringing about the gender dysphoria, we're gonna have more cases like this. And that's why you'll see a lot of people go down the path of transition and still end up even more in despair than they were before. Some of them even end up taking their lives. There's really high rates of suicide among this community, even for people who are accepted by those around them and who undergo medical treatment. So this is just, I think, yet another sad example about that. I don't have anything funny or you know witty to say about this person. I just feel bad that even though you've undergone all these different processes to change who you are as a person doesn't change who you are as a person. And that's what we're trying to scream from the rooftops and people don't want to hear it. At least not yet. They are not ready for it. We're gonna move on to another one. This one's on misgender. It's always a topic. So I got to today at the park. And uh, I'm not saying men can't look like this because it's cool. But like, I'm not doing damage. I'm not a man. 
don't consider me to the people of men. And maybe the people who are like, oh, masculinity is in decline. Well, stop thinking I'm doing anything with it. I'm not part of that equation. Count me out. The enemy has captured the airfield. I'm sorry. We have to look at this individual. Okay, and of course, when you look at people and when you're engaging with people, whether or not you know it or not, you are making all these different calculations in your brain and then deciding how to refer to them. The first thing that I see when looking at this individual is a full-fledged beard at the bottom of your face, which immediately signals to me that you are probably a man. Now, we can try to escape that reality with feminine clothes, wearing a crop top, wearing skinny jeans that seem to have a bulge coming out of the private area. We can try to mask <laughs> our masculinity with these sort of feminine traits and characteristics or traits that we presume to be feminine, but it doesn't always work out. You know, as much makeup as you put on, as much feminine clothing as you put on, I'm going to see through it and see that you are actually a man underneath. And maybe that's why you're getting served at the pharmacy. And when you're presenting this very confusing picture to people, where you look kind of like half man, half woman, it's anybody's guess, you know, what to refer to you as. So I don't know that you can get on those people for misgendering you when you are putting forward very clear characteristics of masculinity. That's on you. And this seemingly is a divide uh, amongst the trans community. A lot of trans people say you really have to dedicate your time and effort towards looking like the gender that you identify with. If you want to be gendered in that way out in public, other people in the trans community disagree and say that all you need to do is say that you're a woman or say that your pronouns are she, her in order to be referred to that way. If I had to lean in either direction, I'd say you probably need to put in a little bit more time and effort if you want to be referred to as a woman. And even then, if people refer to you as sir or he, him, it is not their fault because that is what you are. You know, apologies. Apologies if that's the reality that you find yourself in, but that is where you are. And no amount of makeup or clothing or surgeries or all these different things is necessarily going to change that. But if this individual looked more like the individual reacted to a couple minutes ago, maybe you'd be getting she, her, and maybe you'd be getting called ma'am or lady out in public. And that's not on the person who is misgendering you. Sorry, next. What is something weird about conservatives? There is a, almost a cultish vibe, I feel. The way they operate within themselves, they refuse to listen to outside people, you know, they're uh, refusing to learn, essentially. I think that is a large part of it. No, I know whoever sent me this, don't just set me up. <laughs> With the react, come on now. What am I supposed to say to that? What am I supposed to <laughs> say to that? When this person is telling you they feel like conservatives operate within a cult, what I should just remain silent. Just play crickets. Because there's nothing else. I mean, there's a lot going on here. Clown makeup, green hair. You know what? That's your prerogative. If you want to dress like that, uh, the little like almost like fetish gear that they're wearing on their backpack. Interesting. What I'm really looking at is the tape over the chest. Is that meant to be like a, a top surgery type thing that you're playing out? Has this individual undergone top surgery? Is this the man? Is this the woman? I don't know what's going on. Let me listen to the voice real quick. Hold on. I used to listen to outside people, you know, they're refusing to learn, essentially. I think that is a large part of it. You know what? If, I don't know. I don't know what this person was born as. I'm gonna be honest. You guys will have to let me know. Uh, you know, I'm trying to look underneath the makeup and everything that's going on there, and I can't figure it out. But I gotta say, it's screaming cult for somebody who's accusing conservatives of being in a cult. And if you go and give like a quick Google search of like the characteristics of a cult, you'll find that woke leftism falls in nearly every single category and characteristic that is used to measure a cult. And of course, we can cherry pick and attribute the same thing to conservatives. I'll just say at the end of the day, I don't know that this is the person that I'm looking to for a high powered analysis of conservatives and whether or not they exist in a cult. And that's all. Okay, we're gonna move on. Uh, this next one is about gaming. We all know that the video gaming industry has become increasingly woke. Now we're gonna turn our sights on a game called Dragon Age, which has unveiled some new character customization that you can do that, of course, has to do with gender. Let's find out. So he, him, she, her, and they, them, and then your gender is man, woman, non-binary. 
Love that. Love the inclusivity. Top surgery scars are also included in this for all of our trans and non-binary rooks out there. I absolutely was blown away by this. Um, it's, it's, it's beautiful to see the inclusion in the game and to see yourself represented. Wow! I gotta see that again. I gotta see the chart again. It says you can put on body scars, put the scar shape, the intensity, the color, the discoloration intensity. For those of you who have highly discolored scars and the smoothness, and you can turn on or off top surgery scars. You know what? If you have an audience for this and they want to use it, I, by all means, I guess, customize your game character in this way and allow them to do it. I, I don't know. I don't know that the gaming industry is really asking for this or if there are just people working within the gaming industry who have found themselves in positions of power who want to usher forward this narrative and are allowing things like this to take place. Most of the gamers that I know and that I've seen online want nothing to do with this in their video games and are actively fighting back or choosing not to play games that are injecting this sort of agenda and ideology into the forefront of the game itself. So I just don't know who this is for or like anybody who is necessarily celebrating this other than the handful of people who have undergone top surgery who also happen to be playing Dragon Age. But I guess, go off cis. Not cisgender. Cis. S-I-S. Sorry, guys. But you know what, guys? All I had to do was scroll down, like, one page to find out who is behind this. And of course, it is an actual trans person because there'd really be nobody else who is ushering this forward and adding this into games. Let's go ahead and read this. This is Corinne Bush, who says, as a queer trans woman, shocker, I have a perspective on the games that not everyone has. Dragon Age has long been a place where LGBTQIA plus folks can see people like themselves represented respectfully. It's inherently very queer, and it's such a rare thing for marginalized communities to have representation where we feel proud and powerful in how we are depicted. A younger version of myself to see someone like her in a game. Do y'all remember when video games used to be about escapism? When you went to video games to play somebody who was in no way, shape, or form like yourself so that you could escape from the reality in which you were living in? Now we must self-insert all of these different things into games to make ourselves feel represented so that we can live out our very same lives in video game form. It's like when Dwight Schrute is playing My Second Life in the Office. <laughs> it's just his life pictured in the video game. Who wants that? So much so that his little guy here, he's created his own world. It's called Second Second Life for those people who want to be removed even further from reality. Like, even when I think about this from the perspective of a trans person, wouldn't you go into video games and want to play like this, like, ultra feminine born female character as a form of escapism, rather than throwing on like top surgery scars and bottom surgery to your video game avatar? Make it make sense. I don't know. I guess different strokes for different folks, but this is certainly not for me. And I don't think it's for most who are out there playing games. Whew, that is all we have for today video. Guys, if you ever see any more videos like this, please, please, please send them my way. I love watching them, interacting with you guys while we're talking about these things. And they're always opening up an interesting discussion. If you liked this video, like, subscribe, click the notification bell to be notified every single time I post a video for you guys, which is every day. And if you disagree with anything said in this video, do get out in the comments down below, but do so respectfully. I encourage healthy debate on this channel, but it's got to be healthy. And with that, guys, I will see you next time yeah you better yeah you better Welcome back to the long-awaited second season of Amazon's Rings of Power. In many ways, season two is an improvement, but in many others, it is an excellent demonstration of how to take something that is already bad and make it worse. In episode three... What's going on, YouTube? I am back. So we're here to talk about some woke SJW foolishness. We got low IQ behavior out the yin-yang, and one of the main topics is about someone claiming that Japan was created by, um, by black people. We got one woman having more abortions than you can poke a stick at. We got uh, shoplifting. We got twerking on cars. Just a whole bunch of garbage. But as I always say, first up, make sure you hit the like button and the subscribe button as well if you're new here, because YouTube is screwing me over, not recommending my content to new viewers, 
So this time, I'm genuinely struggling here. Let's have illegal immigrants hunt down sex offenders for a chance at citizenship. We'll call it Aliens vs Predators. That is an absolute masterpiece. Why is the New York City subway a literal shithole and Tokyo is perfection, clean, respectful, quiet, not getting in your face, not playing loud music, not trying to stab you, not trying to, not trying to pee diddy up the clacker. Why the F is everything in my neighborhood store locked up except for the sunscreen? Now let's get to the guy who's saying that uh, Japan was created by black people. He says everything they built was created and designed by black people. We seeded the earth and revolutionized civilization. The reason why Japan has strict immigration laws is because they know they won't be able to compete against the real Japanese. And the, the video here is going to highlight the clear inferiority of the Japanese compared to the real Japanese. Okay, check this out. <laughs> Japanese, you've been beaten hands down. I mean, we all know that, you know, Africa is only the way it is because their most talented people were poached by other countries. That's the only reason. I mean, even though that hasn't happened and they've had plenty of time to supposedly, you know, use all their expertise, all their knowledge that they have there, this world beating knowledge, this world creating knowledge to recreate the best elements of the West on their own continent. For some reason, they haven't been able to do it. I wonder why. But it's not just Japan. I've shown you this one before. Now the claim is that Napoleon, Napoleon Bonaparte, is actually um, of the African variety as well. Interesting. I wonder, how, I wonder how the French feel about that. But there's a new one, or two. Two historical figures have now been uh, claimed by the original <laughs> by the original Japanese these ones here according to this guy here he's got a check mark the Wright brothers were also of uh, African of African heritage as well that the real creators of the first plane the first airplane were these two dudes here all right it has to be because as we know, they were the first real Japanese. But obviously, we all know that's bullshit. But one thing they can get credit for is creating this fashion style. Well, Shorty got her whole derriere out. That is... I, 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 almost, res I almost respect it. Like, respect. That takes dedication. That's dedication right there. They deserve the credit. Let's give them the credit for that. <laughs> and also this type of behavior here, where women, and I use the term very lightly here, women are twerking on cars. Let's check this out. I feel your pain. I definitely feel your pain. It's degenerate, low IQ, gutted trash, ghetto trash behavior. There must be some. There must be some benefit to them doing that. Is it just for the attention, or is it to gain male attention, or like what's that about exactly? Because it's almost like they're competing to see who can be the most grotesque. I mean, the same applies here. This footage out of um, out of Philadelphia of this cop just trying to drive through this area and you've got these takeover low-life scumbag piss ants causing trouble they can't drive for shit you know and they're doing these stupid these stupid things in the middle of the street they're going low IQ all of them every last one is low IQ I love killing babies 
I love Jesus it. Welcome. Jesus welcome. We have to give her the word. I've had like we have to give her the word. abortions but I'm going to keep having them. You need Again, much like those women who are twerking, this same gutter, ghetto, trash, disgusting behaviour. I mean, obviously she's exaggerating. I hope, I hope she's exaggerating. She's talking about it as if it's some type of achievement. Like it's something to be proud of. No matter what your take on abortion is, even if you're pro-choice, I'm sure almost everyone who's pro-choice would see this woman talking like this and just go, that's gross. That doesn't, that doesn't represent my point of view. Like this idea that, um, I've said it before, that this idea of abortion being used as a, as a contraceptive is just, okay, low IQ. Like this one here. I mean, <laughs> I'm surprised so many people can actually, you know, get up in the morning and live a life when you're, when you're this stupid. It's like, <laughs> how do these people exist? That's my main, uh, my main question. My main question is, how do these people exist? Everything like that, dog. I swear. Imagine went to the store for some shit that was four dollars. All the way up. Based on that woman's physique, she's not missing many meals. Right? So she's not doing it really tough. She's obviously getting enough calories to maintain that type of body mass. And she'd be in the obese category at least. Possibly morbidly obese. And she's still stealing food? Come on. All right, come on. <laughs> it's so fucking bad. It's like, what, what is going on? Same here. Another person just taking shoes. Just like a free for all these days. People just take whatever they want. They're taking some bloody. We call them thongs. But in the US, you call them flip flops. She's got to steal something. Steal a new pair of pants. A pair of pants that fit for fuck's sake. <laughs> I don't want to see your goddamn ass crack, you stupid idiot. What's this one? Detroit. Air conditioning. You lock them up now. People stealing those as well. What a shit! <laughs> what a shit hole Detroit must be. And I've criticised the soy infested young people that need safe spaces. I think I'm going to need a space like this if I talk about these topics anymore. Right? <laughs> That's me. Trying to understand these fucking idiots I talk about on a daily basis. <laughs> That's me trying to work out what the hell is going on. I can't. I don't know what's going on. But as I always say, hope you're having a good day as always. And as I always say, get the piss heads the hell out of a stinking house. And I'll play this one here. This is a Trump country. We live in the southeast. We drink sweet tea. We don't drink socialist Kool-Aid. Yes, I agree with him. Now get the hell out of my stinking house. I'll step out of the vehicle for $500. Sir, you can search me for $500 cash. I'll get in the car for get $500. Car. And he's going to be recording what he's going to post. Now you've met the sergeant and you can go to jail. You have just violated my constitutional rights. Whether they're full-blown sovereign citizens or just people who believe the law doesn't apply to them, law enforcement is dealing with very stubborn suspects more and more. And today, we are taking a look at five recent arrests involving drivers who were especially uncooperative. Welcome to Sidebar, presented by Law & Crime. I'm Jesse Weber. Now, if you follow us here on Sidebar, you know we've done stories about sovereign citizens before. This loose collection of people who believe that the U.S. Constitution is invalid and that the laws and law enforcement don't have any jurisdiction over them. But when they're stopped by officers, they quickly learn that that is just not true. Shocking, shocking, I know. All right, so we want to start this off in Edgewater, Florida, where a motorcyclist with a ironic name was stopped July 30th of this year for running a stop sign. And as the officer gets out of his patrol car, you can hear 
Andre Narciss. Yes, like narcissist. Blasting music. Money got loud, this nigga got loud, I'm coming up fast. Oh, let me turn this off, I'm made up, so I'm gonna record all this. Okay. Yeah. I need your driver's license registration and no. proof of insurance. Why, why do you need my driver's license? First of all, why are you pulling me over? Nope. I need your driver's license, your registration, Hold on, we're gonna do this proof again. of insurance. I, I study law, okay. and I'm not a dummy, and I know everybody down okay. at the office. You got about two seconds to give me your information, or you're gonna go to jail. It's as simple as that. Oh, wait, hold on, hold on. I want you to repeat that. Two seconds. I got two seconds or I'm going to go to jail. Yeah, I need your driver's license, your registration, and your proof of insurance. Or you're going to go into handcuffs and you're going to go to jail. You know that's illegal? It is not. It actually is. It actually is. Can you call exactly your supervisor? Closer. Call your supervisor down here. Nope. No, you will call your supervisor down here. Nope. I know my law. You I don't know want to give me right. your stuff? You cannot touch me. Okay. No, you cannot touch me. your stuff. Call your supervisor. Call your supervisor. Why, why are you cuffing me? What the f are you doing? What are you doing to me, bro? What the f? I got neck surgery. I don't care, dude. What the f are you doing? Oh my god, bro. Oh my god. Call Mayor Diesel and call your supervisor right now. You are 100% absolutely wrong for what you just did to me. I'm going to file you care, suit. You can slow everybody down. I'm going to file suit. Call your supervisor. You the to Lips. Call your supervisor. You just committed a crime. Okay. A felony. Okay. Unbelievable. You drew me. I've had neck surgery. Yep. Well, you shouldn't have been resisting me. I didn't resist you. I asked you okay. why'd you stop me. Wow. I'm going to sue the Okay, good luck. No, I will win. It's $100,000 for every violation. You are touching me without your supervisor present. Yeah, because I'm doing my job, buddy. No, it's not your job. You're actually yep. violating my rights. No, I'm not. And on top of that, I'm Native American. Okay. Yeah, do you know you, you're not even allowed to touch me, bro? That's not how it works. You're a commercial entity. You're not even a freaking part of the <laughs> my land, dude. You're, you're a commercial entity. Okay. Narciss was charged with resisting without violence. And here's the interesting part about it. The officer let him know on the ride to jail that if he just provided his license, the officer wouldn't have even given him a ticket. Now he's out on bond and awaiting a court hearing next month. You know what's difficult? You know what's tough? Reading through legal briefs and filings to prepare for sidebar. It's like I'm back in law school. Being told I look like Dennis Reynolds every single time I check the comments. That wears on you. At this point, I think people think he hosts the show. Again, it's tough. But you know what's not difficult? Starting a claim with Morgan & Morgan. How about that transition, by the way? Well, Morgan & Morgan, America's largest injury law firm, they make the process as easy as possible for their clients because from starting your claim to uploading documents to talking to your legal team, it can all be done from your smartphone. There's no upfront fee. You only pay them if you win. And speaking winning, Morgan & Morgan, they have a track record of securing verdicts and settlements in the multi-millions. So if you're injured, this may be the firm you want in your corner. You can easily start a claim at ForThePeople.com slash LC Sidebar. Next, we're in Volusia County, where the sheriff wasn't really happy with a man's conduct during a traffic stop. And we don't know if Juan Rivera necessarily identifies as a sovereign citizen, but he's following pretty much the same playbook very closely, so we thought we'd include him in this list nonetheless. A Volusia County deputy pulled him over on May 16th, 2024 for a broken taillight. Watch what happened. Hello, Sheriff's Office. You got your driver's license on you? Okay, I pulled you over because your taillight's out. Because I'm asking you for it, this is a traffic stop. Yeah. I'm not giving you a verbal warning, I'm telling you. Alright, so this guy, not wanting to identify, he's not going to step out of the vehicle, I can tell you that right now. He's recording uh, his tail lights up, his left one. And he's going to be recording his one of those. Deputy Carroll with Volusia Sheriff's Office, can you turn that down? Do you have your license, registration, and insurance for the vehicle? 
You're the supervisor? Do you have the license? Are you the registration supervisor? And insurance for the I vehicle. I do. Are you the supervisor? Okay, go ahead and have. Are you the supervisor? Are you failing to identify yourself on a legal traffic stop? He's asking for a cockpit. on I asked for a supervisor and they sent another fucking being No. I really asked for a supervisor. Y'all refusing me a supervisor. Refusing to identify, refusing to And you're refusing to get out of the vehicle. Over a freaking tail light on. And you refuse to supervise, you send you send another one that was coming. Listen, it's, it's a legal traffic stop. And Rivera was insistent that a supervisor be called out to the scene, but when the sergeant got there, Rivera was skeptical. You want to speak to the supervisor? I'm the supervisor. So, do you have your driver's license and registration? You're the supervisor. What's your badge? Does that help you? No, no. How do I know you're a supervisor? We just showed you. There's right there. Is, uh... Okay, well, I'm the supervisor. I'm Sergeant Levin with the Sheriff's Office. How can I help you? Okay, do you have your driver's license and registration? When I call the nope. get out of the truck. Why? I'm, I'm verifying. I don't care. You're the supervisor. I just want to get out of the truck. Okay, wait, wait, wait. No, we're not. Okay, I'll give you what Get out of the man. truck. Okay, Watch I'm out. Get out. Let me get out. I'm getting out. Get out. I'm getting the Relax. Truck. Don't slam me. No. It's, it's fine. fine. It's fine, bro. Listen. Hey, relax. 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 This arm is broken. Hey, I don't hey, care. Listen. Put your hands on your I just your wanted to talk to a supervisor. Yeah, no, you didn't. You want to play no. Can I tell you what? No, happened? you can't. Is he gonna look at this? Oh, why, why? Watch that arm. Watch that arm. Please, photo photo. That arm is broken. Stop. Okay. Hold on. Stop. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on. Can I? Can you just tie me up front, please? No. no. This arm is broken. Oh, okay. Quit resisting, and you won't have a problem. I'm not resisting, boss. Look. Can I just explain myself? Please? Nope. Please. You Let see? me just talk to you. Like, I do There's rules on how what happened. stuff works. He told me that it, the light was out. I did it. Yeah, they're not properly working. Sorry, I don't have nothing. Okay. What up? What up? What's the oh. going on? I just uh, I'm right. tired. I'm back here. I'm just trying to get home. Oh. That's all. Now you're gonna go to jail and then you Why? can go. Why, please? Because this isn't a game. I'm not trying to play the game. Okay, well, congratulations. Now you've met the sergeant and you can go to jail. Rivera was booked in a charge of resisting without violence, but not long after, Volusia County Sheriff Mike Chickwood shared this body cam video on the department's social media in order to call out Rivera for claims he made after the arrest. Transparency, that's why we have these body cams. And in a sworn citizen complaint, Rivera accused the deputies of slamming him against his truck, slamming him into the ground, choking him. Yeah, I got to tell you, I don't really see any of that. If you want to malign my deputies, if you want to destroy their character, if you want to try to commit unrest in this community, they're absolutely lying. We're going to out you, and we're going to arrest you. Less than three weeks after his first arrest, Rivera was arrested again, this time with a fresh haircut. Stop it. Stop it. I'm not, I'm not running away. What's going on? You're a warrant for your arrest for perjury. Perjury? Mm -hmm. What is that? Can you He's making a false statement. Are you kidding? Take, please. Perjury for what? That's just what the warrant's for. You'll have to talk to the courts about that. Wow. So a true statement that I have recorded from his arrest. Can I show you my, my video officer, please? Dean, I want to talk to your lawyer about that, all right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, wow. Can I get some shoes? Yeah, can you get some sandals and What do I do from here? He has a $50,000 bond. Um, $50,000? Wow. So he'll be up at the Volusia County Branch Jail. Oh, because the police don't want to get in trouble. Rivera's first arrest, misdemeanor charge, this one, a felony. Rivera ended up getting out on a $500 bond, not $50,000. Both cases are still pending in Volusia County. All right, now let's talk about a case out of Melbourne, Florida, in August of 2022. A Brevard County deputy on a motorcycle was trying to do a traffic stop for an expired tag, and the first part of the body cam footage is muted, but the officer turns on the mic as the driver sets up his own recording. I'm not a driver. Okay, well, you are driving on the roadways in the state of Florida, so I need your driver's license or your identification. Like I said, I'm not driving. Okay, well, I am conducting a lawful stop. You are required to present me your identification, so I'll take whatever identification you have. Okay, I, I don't carry identification. 
location unless someone can hand me for my name. My name is registered as my father. Okay. So. So what's your name? Okay. Uh, I'm just recording this for the record. I'm not driving or operating a vehicle for hire or place. And my name is my private property. Sir, you will be arrested if you do not present some type of identification. Really? Excuse me? I said really? Yes, sir, really. Why do I need to provide identification? You are operating a, road, a vehicle on the roadways in the I'm state of Florida. Operating. Sir, with all due respect, you're behind the driver, in the driver's seat, behind the driving. steering wheel. I'm not I've been driving. behind. Now, if you want to try and prove in court that I'm driving or operating a vehicle for hire, sorry, but I'm standing for the record that I'm not driving or operating a vehicle. Sir, I've been behind you since you're on Babcock, okay? Yeah. You've been in that seat the entire time. I'm telling you on the record I'm not driving or operating. That's, that's official. Okay. And if you want my name, it's 500 dollars Okay. Good. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
as that term is an oxymoron invented by the Fraternal Order of Police to confuse people during the operation of the police's perfected racket. And when the state sent Farnham a notice to appear for docket sounding, he apparently sent it back to reject written crossing. Well, after more court shenanigans, a competency hearing was ordered for Farnham. A mental health expert wrote up a report that said Farnham would need mental health treatment before he would be competent to go to trial. And I want to talk about the competency report because there was interesting testimony from a Dr. Jeffrey Williamson, and it says, quote, in his testimony, Dr. Williamson acknowledges the difficulty in distinguishing between a sovereign citizen who is merely choosing not to participate and who is misusing language in a bizarre manner for the purposes of delay and subversion of the process and an individual who, as a result of mental illness, is behaving inappropriately and unable to cooperate with counsel or take part in the proceedings. Notwithstanding that difficulty, Dr. Williamson testified that, in his opinion, the defendant suffers from a delusional disorder. So for now, Farnham will continue to receive mental health treatment. Hey, I want to quickly highlight a sponsor of Sidebar that makes episodes like this possible, and that is Noble Gold. Look, if you're worried about the future of the economy, this could be the company for you. Why? Because with so much uncertainty these days, it's natural to be concerned about the security of your retirement savings, but there is one asset that stands the test of time. You guessed it, gold. For centuries, gold has been a hedge against market volatility and economic instability. By rolling over your existing IRA or 401k into a self-directed gold IRA, you can enjoy the potential for long-term growth and stability. Diversify your portfolio with a tangible asset that has real value. Setting up your gold IRA has never been easier with Noble Gold Investment's streamlined process and expert guidance. And right now, Noble Gold will give you a 10-ounce Silver American flag bar if you open a qualified account. Go to longcrimegold.com now. That's longcrimegold.com. There's always a risk of investment and no guarantee of any kind. Moving on, another simple traffic stop that led to much more serious charges, this time in Palm Beach Gardens, Florida. It is May of 2023, and a police sergeant on routine patrol spots a car with a New York license plate. And when dispatch runs it, it comes back as being unregistered and not having insurance. Hey, buddy. You ready to run it down for me? I can't hear you. You need to run it down for me. Just a little bit more for me, please. Go ahead, give me another unit. Okay, may I see your driver's license, please? Registration and proof of insurance. The reason I'm stopping you, sir, your tax zone is suspended for no no insurance. No, sir. I'm sorry? I said, sir. Okay, we're not going to play that game today, okay? After he asked for the officer's name and badge number, the driver, who we now know is James Lattimore, placed a yellow constitutional rights card against the window, saying he won't be answering any questions. Show me proof of insurance, and we're done. It's a very simple process. Drivers, 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 drivers refusing to cooperate, refusing to give any information. Did you supervise it? I am a supervisor, sir. Unreadable. I don't answer questions. I don't need that, sir. Yes, you do. No, I don't. I don't answer questions. <clears throat> Sovereign citizen. I need a unit. I Refusing to ID. We get 14. I don't answer questions. Come for I copy Sovereign I'm citizen. I need an additional I'm unit. Not sir, not I'm explaining this. J are you James? Are you James? James? I do not answer questions. Sir, let me let me explain this to you. I really don't want to go down this road with having to take you out of the car for failure to identification. Sir, the window will come down. Okay? Don't be reaching for anything in the car. Okay? I don't answer questions. Okay, well, you're gonna have to give me your information, sir, by Florida law. Okay? And let me guess, you're traveling, right? You're not driving a vehicle? I don't answer questions. Okay, well, I need your ID. Your tag is suspended, you have no insurance, and it says, according to you, according to the DMV, your your, your driver's license is suspended. Okay, so, you really want to go to jail over something silly like this? When it could just be a ticket? Is that what you really want to do? All right, step out of the car. 